that we can save a little bit of time. Um, we have a packed agenda today. Sarah, just if I can break in for one second, just so that everyone knows we are recording this now. So um, you're so warned and um, sorry, back to you. Oh, thank you. Uh, actually, are there any housekeeping yes. things that we need to say about Zoom? I think most people probably know at this point. I think we're good. We, we will make this recording available so that will go up and that will go out on the, the, serve, uh, the list serve so that everybody is aware of that. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Uh, Sarah Ryan with the Big Valley Band of Pomo Indians, and I'm also one of the co-chairs of CCHAB. I'd like to welcome you to today's meeting, and if the other co-chairs can introduce themselves, I appreciate that. This is Becky Stanton. Um... Uh, with Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, um, one of the other co-chairs, and good morning, welcome. And this is Dave Karen, of uh, University of Southern Cal. Good morning. All right, thank you for introducing yourselves. And again, please uh, put your contact info as a way of introduction into the chat, if everybody else could do that, I'd appreciate that. Um, we are going to go into our uh, 9 a.m. Uh, agenda item. You can see the agenda on the screen, hopefully. Um, uh, there is going to be a little bit of time for announcements too, besides what you see on here, but let's go ahead into um, Becky is going to give us an update on ITRC. Sorry, just getting everything set up. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to announce um, as part of the um, Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, um, ITRC, um, I was on the um, Harmful Cyanobacterial Bloom Team that was led by um, Ben Holcomb of Utah DEQ and Angela Shamba of, of Vermont, I think also DEQ. Um, I was since retired and um, We've uh, spent a lot of time and finally got our web page with the guidance document now live. That's what I'm sharing now. Um, I will put the uh, link in the chat as well. Um, so that is, is now available for your use and enjoyment. Um, please take a look. We're um, excited to have that now be available. Um, so I also share that there's um, going to be live um, online training April 29th. I'll also put the link to sign up for that, which is now live um, in the chat as well. Um, we welcome to you um, to join us in that. And those will also be recorded and um, available for um, subsequent on-demand viewing as well, as I think it's gonna be split out into the um, different modules that accompany each of these um, sections as well with the document, but it'll be delivered initially as a, uh, I think, two hour um, uh, cumulative training. So um, just a little bit of tips on the, so there's these interactive tools um, in the navigation bar, um, nutrient reduction. Um, you can see this is a, a clickable, if I get there, a clickable graphic. So if you look or hover over any of the red dots that talks about different, um, um, potential aspects that can be addressed for nutrient reduction um, for the monitoring tool. And give me a second to load it. It's um, clickable based on whether or not you're trying to look for cyanobacteria or cyanotoxins, whether or not a lab is required and what the approximate turnaround time is. Um, and then as you um, click and unclick the boxes, the number of uh, applicable monitoring methods change. Um, and these are uh, hyperlinks to this description in the text. Uh, for management criteria, it's a, a bit more complicated. These are links to the different management strategies. So it uh, defaults to all of them showing. Um, and then if you wanna look at um, in-link intervention and there's the little hover uh, definitions or um, uh, prevention, um, the level of um, uh, field data that's supporting it, um, water body type, again, um, particularly focused on um, um, pond, lake, or reservoir, although there are some that um, apply to any. Um, I know there's questions about, well, what about rivers or streams? Um, and then some of these other criteria. Um, 
So um, for example, if it's a, a drinking water source, which this is a little complicated, but you unselect. <laughs> so um, so that those are all available. And again, these link to the individual fact sheets. And then for risk communication, um, it's maybe less a tool, but if you click on what topic you're interested in, like if I want to look at visual observations in an immediate time frame in the midst of the bloom, we just got a quick summary of the tasks that you might look at and some examples. Um, if you look at a more long term with visual observations, it links you to the monitoring and the same list of examples. So. Um, <clears throat> And then each of these um, has an overview. This, um, and then if you close the tool, um, you can open up the um, overall sections of the guidance and, and go from there. Um, there are some things with the navigation, depending on where you're at in the document, you may need to close it to be able to see the bottom. So apologies for that, but that's part of the um, default of the, the navigation. So um, any questions briefly on that? <laughs> Okay, well, thanks for the opportunity. And if any, you have any follow-up, uh, feel free to let me know. And I will stop sharing. Thank you, Becky. Um, anyone else? Are there other announcements? Please go ahead and uh, I see Corolla has raised her hand. Yes, hi, this is Corolla Kennedy from Robinson Rancheria. First, I wanna check and see if there's anybody from the drinking water division, because it is actually a report out for them. Not hearing anybody, so I'll go ahead and just report out. So a cyanobacteria related monitoring order was issued last week by the State Division of Drinking Water in Clear Lake to the 18 public water systems. The systems will be monitoring for microcystin for both raw and finished waters on either a weekly or every two weeks during the summer months starting May 1st and going till October 31st. And triggered monitoring will be happening during the winter months. Um, that's all I have to report on that. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Corolla. Are there any other mm -hmm. announcements? Or are there, are there any questions for Corolla on that? Okay, any other announcements? Okay. So we will go ahead and go into our regional coordinators HAB reports. Um, just FYI, the uh, presentation that's at 10 a.m. cannot be moved. So if we get through our HAB, HAB reports early, then uh, we might take our break at that point uh, unless there's another topic to, to fit in. So um, yeah, so because the 10 a.m. Uh, she won't be here till 10. All right, so let's go ahead into our, HAB, our, our regional coordinators HAB reports. And do we have someone from region one? Yeah, Rich is here, Rich Fadness. Um, currently, it's it's rather quiet in the region. We haven't really had anything going on except for um, uh, a a planktonic um, um, cyanobacteria uh, bloom that may be starting up in Tule Lake. Uh, Keith and I were both in communication with them. They've set up a monitoring plan uh, and asked for our guidance. And Becky was uh, on the call as well. Um, to see about moving forward with their with their efforts to monitor up there. Their, their concern up there at the moment seems to be uh, saxitoxin. Uh, they have low level hits, but they're concerned about um, aerolization. They're concerned about irrigation, uh, irrigation of food products, um, both uh, beets and I think it's potatoes, and then some grains and things like that. So they're, uh, they're concerned about <clears throat> the potential human, uh, human impacts from that. And so, uh, I think they're kicking off their monitoring plan here in the next couple of weeks. That's about all we have right now. 
Is, is that a lake that's managed by the <clears throat> county or? Um, it's not county. Um, it, uh, so Fish and Wildlife Service um, monitors it or actually runs it, I guess, for <clears throat> um, duck migration, bird migration, as well as a, it's an irrigation um, community. So I think it's, it's, it's like an irrigation uh, authority of some type that uh, manages it because it, uh, it basically feeds that whole Tule Lake uh, area, agricultural area. And it's generally just used for that. It's not used for any other purposes. Thank you. Any other questions for Rich for Region 1? Thank you, Rich, for that report. Are there, uh, so let's go ahead into Region 2. So anyone from Region 2 on the phone? I'm sorry, this is uh, Sue Keitel with EPA. I wanted to add on to Rich's Region 1. Um, Big Lagoon on the coast of the North Coast had submitted samples to EPA and a couple of them had low levels of microcystin in them, less than one uh, part per billion, but still a positive detect. And that has been sent to the, the state reporting database. Thank you, Sue. What were those water bodies? Uh, it's called Big Lagoon. It's on the North Coast coast, just south of the um, Redwood Regional Park and the Klamath South. Thank you. Okay, it sounds like we didn't have uh, anyone from Region 2 on the phone at this point. If they do come in, we'll make sure they get a chance to report. How about region this, three? This is, uh, this is Hal McLean, uh, region two, I guess. Oh, sorry, Hal, go ahead, thank you. Oh, it's okay. Um, yeah, we've, we've got uh, danger um, advisory at Lake Anza and Quarry Lakes. And uh, we've got a caution advisory at our Lake Del Val. And uh, looks like we're gonna potentially be open up for swimming Memorial Day, so we'll see how the Habs affect all this kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, that's that's what I got for right now. What was the name of the lake with the danger advisory? We've got uh, Lake Anza in Berkeley and uh, Quarry Lakes in Fremont. Okay, thank you. All right, anyone else from Region 2 or questions for Hal? Okay, how about Region 3? This is Keith at the State Board. Melissa Doherty, the Region 3 coordinator, emailed me and said she wouldn't be able to uh, attend. And so I have a, a two short updates on her behalf. Um, one is that uh, we were responding to a um, series of water bodies that had a bloom in the Monterey, uh, the town of Monterey and also the town of Seaside. And it was, um, uh, the one is called Lake Alistero. And it was a, a rather interesting situation <laughs> because um, these are um, right near the, the coast with a uh, Monterey Bay and um, were originally like tidal wetlands that had then been diked off and um, sort of turned into inland lakes that are you know heavily managed and surrounded by a city infrastructure. And, um, and so they pump water out into the bay to manage the lake levels. And it was actually sampling at the Monterey Wharf through plankton net toes that identified a bunch of cyanobacterial filaments in the water around Monterey Wharf, which we then um, kind of trace back to these inland lakes. Um, and so uh, Planktothrix was blooming there. Um, and uh, the cyanotoxin samples all came back as non-toxic. So it appears that they are non-toxic strains, uh, but it's been a really great um, interaction with the city of Monterey and Seaside as well, well as county health, um, figuring out where where these blooms were occurring, if they were toxic, you know, potential impacts to the coastal ocean, and we are um, continuing to work with them to now set up a more of a um, longer term monitoring um, of those water bodies in case um, the blooms do turn toxic. Um, so that's um, was was a rather interesting event for us um, with such a clear linkage from uh, 
the um, freshwater environment into the near shore coastal ocean. And then um, second, Melissa Darty has um, been reaching out to a lot of water body managers and partners in the area, helping to arrange the um, delivery of permanent signs, which the water boards had printed last year. Uh, so that um, we've been um, sending her some of those so that she can distribute them to um, the local managers uh, so that they are um, more better um, prepared for uh, communication to the public. And uh, those are some of the updates I'm aware of, aware of on Melissa's behalf. Thank you, Keith. Are there any questions for Keith about what he just reported on for Region 3? All right, uh, we will move to Region 4. Anyone on for Region 4? Okay, we will move to Region 5. Matt, I thought I saw you come on and we'd like to report out for, for Clear Lake, but um, do you have uh, anything you'd like to say for region, the rest of Region 5? Generally, uh, we we did have four HAB reports for Region 5 um, that came through in February and March. And really, there's nothing that's been confirmed as a cyanobacteria bloom. Um, we had a report for Lake Isabella, Lake Isabella that an RV was dumping um, black water from their holding tanks into the lake and that it caused a cyanobacter or just a, an algae bloom, but we didn't really have any confirmation of that. And that was back in January that, that they witnessed that. Um, and then the Kern County is, is scheduling a field, um, <clears throat> a look in the field on uh, April 1st. So they'll be able to, to, conf to confirm if there's anything going on at, at Lake Isabella. And then we had a, another report for Lake Combi on the Placer, Nevada County line and the Nevada Irrigation District went up and looked and they couldn't confirm anything. Um, and then we had a, a bloom report um, just at a seasonal wetland on somebody's private property. And I think Keith um, talked to the, or received photos of that. Um, so he could speak about that a little bit better. And then we, we did have a dog illness report in the Delta at Three Mile Slough at Brandon Island State Recreation Area. Um, and I went out there a few weeks ago, but I wasn't able to confirm any cyanobacteria in the in the water out there. And that's about it. Thank you, Matt. Um, I know for Clear Lake. Uh, the uh, tribes are continuing the, uh, in the wintertime, we do a monthly cyanobacteria uh, monitoring. In uh, February, we did find uh, there was one location where there was warning levels of microcystin. It was a little over nine micrograms per liter uh, with the cyanobacteria of microcystis. Um, we are seeing uh, some planktothrix in the waters as well, but, uh, and uh, lingvia, a little bit of lingvia, but not, not too much. Uh, this go around this March, uh, we just finished our monthly monitoring. Uh, as I said, that's what we're doing in the winter is just monthly and um, checked uh, 12 locations on the lake and found um, and sent off to sent off about four of them to the lab uh, after we did a Braxis strips and uh, the same site that had a uh, warning last month had caution levels of microcystin at a little over two. Um, again, uh, we're seeing microcystis uh, when we're doing microscopy. Um, but uh, overall, lake's looking pretty good. Um, the other thing is we're involved in a project, uh, Big Valley is involved in a project with Tracking California, which is part of 
California Department of Public Health. And this summer, well, we're, we're doing monitoring of private drinking water intakes on the, and near shore wells on the lake. And uh, um, in, we've been doing nitrates, uh, testing for nitrates in coliform, but this summer we'll be uh, testing the participants' water, tap water for cyanotoxins. And uh, so we'll report back on, on that. But we are finding with, uh, I think it was uh, eight of the 12 uh, participants we just recently sampled had nitrates or total coliform in their tap water. So uh, we're going to, it'll, you know, we're looking forward to testing those same um, participants and more, hopefully, uh, for herbicides this, this summer and then cyanotoxins this, uh, the, you know, at the end of the summer uh, to see what the, pri these are the private intakes where they don't, you know, they're not part of public water systems. Um, that's all I have for Clear Lake. Uh, any other Region 5 report outs or questions for Matt or myself? All right, uh, let's move to Region 6. Anyone from Region 6? Hi, this is Sabrina. Um, everything's been pretty quiet so far. Uh, we did have one reported dog illness at Lake Gregory, and uh, I believe that's still under investigation. And then we had one other bloom report come in and that water body was partially in our region and partially in Nevada. And then um, we will be beginning one of our special studies in the Tahoe Keys this month. And that's all I really have to report at this time. I'm sorry, the, the special studies is in what, lo for what location? The Tahoe Keys. Okay. And that's, um, they have a, a laminar flow aeration system in the Tahoe Keys that we are monitoring its effectiveness. Thank you. <clears throat> Is that something that you might want to report out or, or do a presentation on uh, later in the year? Um, I could talk to my supervisor about that. Um, they, they also do several other things in the, in the keys. So um, yeah, I guess it might be an interesting topic to bring forward to everyone. Yeah, I would second that. This is Angela from Lake County. We would really be interested in learning because there is so many interactions in that area. I know there's been a lot of aquatic plant management and other things. So it would be good to hear um, about that at some future date if possible. Hi, this is uh, Elena Mystico, Region 6. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to add on to that, that the Tau Keys has been very proactive with the harmful algal bloom pr program throughout the years, and they have done um, presentations themselves in the past. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if possible, um, we could find out if they are doing anything as well and present that to the group. That would be really wonderful. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, Angela's got her thumbs up. I agree that, you know, I, I bet several of the water body managers here are dealing with uh, keys and uh, the water quality in keys. So it'd be great to hear uh, what they've done at the Tahoe Keys and especially if it's been successful or even if it hasn't been successful, that's really useful. Um, so we will, uh, Elena, if your number um, is in, or if your contact info is in the um, chat, then uh, the kid chairs can reach out and. Uh, um, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, the best contact actually would be Sabrina Rice. I just wanted to also congratulate her. She has just taken um, the HAB role for our Region 6 office. Um, so she will be our contact moving forward. Thanks, Elena. <laughs> Congratulations, Sabrina. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will contact Sabrina then. Thank you for that. Um, Region 7. Uh, 
Any report outs for Region 7? Okay. Uh, how about Region 8? Um, it's been pretty quiet over here as well. Um, we were approved for a special study for Big Bear Lake and Lake Elsinore. Um, and the primary objective of this project is to fill the FHAB monitoring gaps, um, such as the scarce winter data and the insufficient temporal and spatial coverage. Um, we're hoping to begin this towards the end of May. We're going to start doing like a um, like trial for how we're going to be doing our sampling and then uh, kick it off a little bit more in the June time frame. Thank you. And that's a regional board special study? Yes, it is for uh, Lake um, Elsinore and Big Bear Lake. Thank you. Any questions for her? All right, so how about Region 9? All right, so we've, um, uh, any, uh, Comments overall, I, I know we don't have a FHAB uh, a kind of larger conversation on the agenda, but um, Keith, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, I guess, can I put you on the spot? <laughs> sure. <laughs> right now, do you have any comments about these reports or just kind of what your plans are for this, um, this season? Do you know if we're going to have, a, are you looking for holiday um, data and things like that? Yeah, yeah, no, this is great. Happy to give a little bit of a, a state state board update too. Um, so, um, Marissa and I have been uh, doing a fair bit of work in uh, like strategic planning for the resources that we received at the end of 2020 due to the the BCP coming through. So, um, the um, one, one line of that um, that that we've been more on the side of, but is um, the hiring of new FHAB positions. So um, as Alana just mentioned, Sabrina was the um, regional board six hire that came out of um, of that. And so um, we've got, um, you know, she's on board, um, new staff should be coming on in April and May. So we're um, excited to start training those staff and I have a, a more capacity within our agency, both at the state and regional board level. Um, we've, um, we also have several contracts that are up for amendment in our um, in our office at the state board and now for the first time we have that seven hundred fifty thousand dollars per year of contracting dollars and so um, we were able to put um, last year's money into our Ben genetics cyanotoxin um, uh, laboratory con um, contract and so um, through that money we were able to fund some of these um, special studies that were just mentioned uh, by the regional board so on um, that big bear lake study and the Tahoe Keys study um, we were able to help to provide additional funds to the regional boards for cyanotoxin analyses through that Ben contract. And then um, we are um, now in a process of, um, in the next month or so, um, identifying um, some additional projects that we can um, uh, pursue through contracting funds. Um, and a lot of that is being informed through the um, FHAB strategy document, which you guys all uh, we're getting the, the updates from last year, and uh, I'm also happy to announce that we finalized that um, at the end of last week. And so um, you can consider this a preliminary announcement um, of that, but we will be doing uh, more communication here later this week, um, stating that that document is finalized and available for um, uh, download um, through the SCORP web website. Uh, so we're really happy um, that that is, uh, is finalized and we'll be uh, using that to um, to, to chart out the path for the next few years. Uh, one other thing um, you mentioned is the um, pre-holiday assessments. So one of the um, recommendations of the strategy was to continue to do those pre-holiday assessments. And so with the increased um, staff and financial resources, we um, are planning to do three of them this summer. So a pre-Memorial Day, a pre-Independence Day, and a pre-Labor Day assessment. So we will begin reaching out to partners um, in April to start to set that up. Um, we've already been 
purchasing um, extra supplies to support those. And um, we're hoping that what that can help um, us do is start to create some, um, you know, both intra annual um, time series and then also a um, multi-year time series with partners as we continue to the fund um, monitoring at the same water bodies um, throughout the season and then over the years. Um, so that um, that will be um, a bigger effort that we have this, this upcoming year um, in addition to the, the incident response. Um, so yeah, that was a lot, um, but um, I think those are some of the key, key high level developments um, that have been going on at the state board uh, at the beginning of the year. Thank you for that, Keith. Um, are there any questions for Keith? Uh, Sarah, actually, uh, excuse me, Sarah, uh, Angela had a question, I believe, for Keith. She had her hand raised. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi, Keith. Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, so I can't remember the last year is blurry, of course, for everybody, but if it was end of 2019 or last year, we got signage from you guys. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've had for the last year, we've had five ramps where we've had the big signage. That's the EPA sign for the Sinohabs. Um, and it has like the family on the beach and it has some general things. So those signs have been out in the sun all year and they're kind of warped. Um, we're doing our best to keep them up, but I'm wondering if there's plans to be able to distribute those, those signs again, or if you guys can give us the information so we can print new ones. They're, they're really good. They're very attractive. Um, and they look really nice in our, our kiosks on our ramps with other things. And I'm just, I'm just questioning about that. If you have any information on that, or if, do you need to see the ones that we have that are all warped and faded for replacements or, or what about the, the signs? We have a lot of the thicker or the um, warning danger caution ones. We still have those left. So that's fine for this year. Um, but it was for the other ones that are general information, the US EPA ones. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Angela. Yes, uh, we do. Um, we still have those um, from that first printing effort. So if um, if you're interested, you can send me an email and let me know how many you need and I can start to uh, arrange getting those to you guys. Um, they we also um, and that that's applies to anybody else on the call that, that might be a water body manager. We do still have um, uh, a stock of those in our office. Um, and um, I also will put in a moment here in the chat the, the link to the PDF where you could also, um, if you did want to print them in other sizes or, or make them available um, in other formats, um, the, the PDF, a high resolution PDF is available on the HAPS portal. And I'll, I'll get that um, in there in a moment. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Keith? All right, so uh, we have reached the end of our regional HAB reports. And as I mentioned, we can't start a, uh, the 10 until 10. I, um, I wanna ask the other co-chairs, what do you think about uh, moving into maybe the uh, 1145 topic, the discussion of the meeting schedule and topics? That would be okay with me. Uh, this is Dave, Karen. Sarah, I actually had a question of Matt. Okay. Uh, which is a little off the wall, maybe, but for the for the wonderful person who is caught uh, dumping black water into a lake, I assume there must be uh, uh, laws against that. And I was wondering what those were, and and I was wondering who do you call when you see something like that taking place. That is definitely against the law. Personally, I would call the sheriff if I witnessed that. I mean, I, I would think that would be a, a crime that would warrant warrant just regular police or sheriff. I don't know if anybody else has something to add. You can also call California Department of Fish and Wildlife. There's also a um, the Cal EPA complaint system. Um, that you can log these complaints and it'll go to uh, the appropriate agency in the appropriate jurisdiction. So I imagine, I imagine a picture and a picture of the license plate it would be the functional things here? Well, yeah, any, any information that you could provide to the, the response team would be good. So yeah, a picture of the discharge, uh, a picture of the license plate. I wouldn't recommend taking a picture of the, the actual person their, like their face, um, that could be somewhat problematic, but yeah, definitely the, the discharge, if you see it, 
and any other information, the more pictures, the better, because uh, uh, it sometimes we'll get one picture that just shows the discharge itself, like a, just a puddle, but there'll be no contextual information. So you can't really say, well, someone was doing this or it was on this street. You know, I, I think the more pictures that you have, the better. And it looks like in the chat, uh, people have been putting some of the tip lines. Uh, Nick has shared the Cal EPA complaints. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Angela has put the uh, Cal OES discharges um, uh, warning center number. Um, Becky, Cal tip. Um, those are um, those are, are great. Oh, and Sue Kaidel from EPA is that, yeah, the Cal EPA complaint system because it reaches multiple agencies. So, um, and then she's got a, if you receive future complaints via the Urban Waters website, suggest they file a complaint here. So um, that was something that Mary Hamilton at Region 3 gave me and Nick's address is much more succinct and goes to the same place. Yeah, that's the best, that's the best mechanism because it's like, it'll reach the right agency and then the pictures are good. I like Dan, Dave, um, how do I say Dan? Dave, uh, Dave's um, suggestion about if you can get like a license plate, that's, that really helps. Um, but you can do it in all sorts of pollution, air, water, pesticides, but that's the place to go. I know on, on Clear Lake, um, I think it was two summers ago, there was a, a what do you call it, a carnival and some of the carnival goers noticed that one of the trailers was was uh, basically had a pipe coming out of their trailer and, and and discharging it right at the right near the lake, and there were many people sp talking about it. And and you know once we got the information out, you know here's a tip line. You know whenever you're seeing whenever you see some sort of discharge to the land or water, uh, call this tip line. Uh, so it's it's good to educate the public about it as well because they. You know, they, they start to put two and two together about pollution and then water quality. So, um, so I'm, I'm glad we have that discussion. Hey, this is James with Orange County. I was going to add that um, local stormwater programs typically have reporting mechanisms too. We have a hotline and a website to report things like this. And one thing I've learned with RV dumps is, um, and just like, if, if it's on a public street, I do agree with law enforcement because they can for, enforce through the vehicle code. Um, you know, if it's an abandoned vehicle or something like that, or so, something uh, that they would enforce on that. And if it's on private property, um, typically there's local code enforcement officers that the lo local agencies have that can enforce codes on, on RVs that are on people's private property that are doing things they're not supposed to. So just some information. Thanks. Thank yeah, you. just to, to echo James, uh, I, I've used the, the Orange County system before and it, it works great. Then uh, their stormwater staff uh, re respond really quickly. So that's also a great option to get things done uh, in a timely manner. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to put up the 2021 uh, meeting schedule. This is going to be uh, put if it has. I don't think it's been been added into the, you know, on the listserv and on the CC Hub website yet. But um, July 21st, we already had scheduled and informed people about. But these two dates were just chosen. So please note that the that the winter CC Hub meeting is actually going to be in January. And that is usually a longer meeting so that we can have a full report outs from the regions and the subcommittees that you know span the entire year and any sort of evaluations you have on the entire year. So um, those are those dates. Um, and so please put those on your schedule. And we are also taking topics, um, you know, things that are, uh, of interest to the group, uh, we want to try to arrange presentations from, from your, uh, you know, from your ideas. So it sounds like we there was, uh, we mentioned possibly a presentation on the Tahoe Keys for later this um, later this year, perhaps. Uh, are there any other thoughts of some some important topics that people would like to cover?
Don't all talk at once. <laughs> all right. Well, if you have uh, if you have thoughts on that, please send them to the co-chairs or uh, you know bring it up during this meeting. I guess we'll go ahead and take sure. our. Oh, no, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say there was one, um, and I. I I think I CCD. There's one from uh, Joe Morgan at um, at EPA. Uh, they put together a new um, the new Arid West Streamflow Duration Assessment Method or SDAM, um, which I think could be. And he's interested in sharing that information um, with some of the work groups. And I he had already identified uh, the flows group and the Healthy Watersheds Partnership. But I I said that he I suggested to him that reaching out to CC Have Network it would be um, interesting to to this group as well so that could be a topic um, if you guys were interested in thanks nick and that's joe morgan you said with epa yeah joseph morgan and i i, I maybe i think i maybe i just included um, becky on on my response to him but um he would be that'd be an interesting one i think for the group to as a tool or added kind of you know thing to your toolbox when when considering Habs, especially as we enter into another drought year. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, I put the um, link in the basic description in the chat too. Thank you. No, thanks. Thank you. Other thoughts? You, you know, we had some discussion earlier, uh, I, I guess at a previous meeting about uh, wildfire and HABs. And we know that the mitigation subcommittee had a, a great presentation the other uh, day or the other, um, I guess the other week. And, and there might be a little bit of discussion about that during the subcommittee reports. We do have two presentations on today's um, agenda regarding wildfire and HABs. So we're looking forward to those presentations. The question is, does the group feel like we should go into a uh, some further, you, you know, detail on that with a like a mini summit later this year or early next year on on wildfire and uh, hab impacts or, or wildfire impacts on habs or um, any other thoughts about that topic. Yeah, this is Hal McLean. Uh... I was I saw that presentation and it was really good and uh, I think you know it was I, I think that it'd be really good to do a a, a mini summit on it because there uh, we're we're having more fires and it's affecting more lakes and and you know and, and I think uh, it is something that I, I'm not very well versed on and would like more information on. Okay, well, was this... that presentation available? Was that recorded? This is Ethan Artunian. I'm wondering because I think that's the, uh, I think the slides I were. Uh, I think the slides were uh, posted somewhere. I think David Karen probably knows that where they are. Yeah, I probably should. Um, uh, the um, <laughs> the sub the subcommittee is is kind of in a transition right now. Kerry Austin is giving over to uh, Hugh Dalton, who will be running it. I don't think Hugh is on the line or carry for this particular uh, call. I'd, I'd have to check to see if that was recorded. Um, but I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, Chris and Rebecca, who gave the talk, wouldn't mind if we made those public, but I could check with them and um, we can get that. Uh, we can get a pointer maybe put up on the, the list, sir, for that. It was a great talk. Awesome. That'd be great. So we'll follow up to see how to make that available, uh, if it can be available. And if you, if anyone has ideas on who would be good to speak on the wildfire and HABs topic, as well as uh, other topics, please let the co-chairs know and we will uh, help facilitate that and, and bring them to the, bring them to the meeting. So any other thoughts before we, I think we're gonna need to move into an, an early break and then have our 10 a.m. Um, presentation. Wish we could do it early, but we can't.
Okay, so uh, we will take a break until 10 a.m. Uh, please come on back to hear a presentation about microcystin accumulation in shellfish by Dr. Ellen Priest. Thank you. We're deviating slightly from the agenda. Um, if you are looking at your agenda, uh, please note that we will not be taking a break after this presentation, but we will go into the, um, the 1040 presentation. So uh, that gives uh, a few more minutes for questions and discussion after uh, Ellen's uh, talk. Um, and we've also started on the, uh, the 1145 topic. It was just a kind of a light morning. So uh, we will, uh, we might be getting out a little bit early today, which is, I'm sure everybody will look forward to that. Um, so anyway, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ellen Priest, who's a senior limnologist from Roberts and Bryan Incorporated, who will be speaking on microcystin accumulation in shellfish. Thank you, Ellen, if you'd like to go ahead. Okay, thanks. So I actually, I'm gonna be presenting on two topics. Um, but the majority of the talk will be what this title slide is, which is microcystin accumulation and shellfish implications for native species and human health. This is a project that we have Proposition 1 funding for, and I'm working closely with San Francisco Estuary Institute, Tim Otten with Ben Genetics, Janice Cook with the Central Valley Water Board, and the Fisheries Foundation, who is out there collecting samples for us. And so um, we've, we only have preliminary results at this point. We first started sampling in late August 2020. And so I'm going to present those preliminary results to you today. But I'm going to start the talk with a few slides for the rationale for why we started this study. So for those of you that are less familiar with the Delta, uh, microcystis was first detected here in 1999. Downstream of the Delta, wild marine mussels tested positive for microcystins during every month of the year in a study conducted by Gibble and others. And there's concern that um, cyanobacteria blooms within the Delta are producing toxins that are then accumulating in the delta shellfish. This is a summary of other studies, um, mostly in the US, but one in Italy, where we looked at microcystin accumulation in shellfish. And um, we found that there were very high concentrations of microcystin, higher than World Health Organization tolerable daily intake levels at all of the study sites. Um, so the San Francisco Bay, which is that Gibble study that I just showed. Um, and then up in the Puget Sound, Washington was some work that I did. And then also found at high concentrations in blue crab in Louisiana and Virginia. Here in the Delta, this is um, some unpublished data um, from Dave Sen and Tim Otten and provides some of the rationale for why we wanted to do our study. This was looking at P. amaranthus, which is more of a brackish water clam. And uh, they had two sites, site eight, which um, was more brackish and site four, which although brackish was more of a freshwater site. And what they found with some archived muscle samples that were actually used for another study, but they decided to do some microcyst ana analysis on was that there were really high concentration of microcystin in these clams, and interestingly, it seemed to be much higher microcystin in the fresher water sites. So that leads into our project. So the goal of our project was to determine, I've, I've only mentioned microcystin, but we're also interested in looking at saxitoxin to determine if there's stressors on food webs and native fish, including managed species, particularly interested in the sturgeon. So um, there hasn't been a lot of work on saxitoxin in the Delta, but there's been some preliminary work indicating low concentrations of it. And um, another study by Jennifer Graham showed that the toxic genotypes were present. And so we thought it's just a subset of our samples, but that it would be interesting to explore if saxitoxin was accumulating in the mussels. 
So for our site selection, we chose, and I'll show you a map on the next slide, but 10 sites that have known cyanobacteria issues. And then also we wanted to make sure that we had sites that have known sturgeon habitat. And for anyone that knows much about juvenile sturgeon, you can really find them in all locations of the Delta. And so it wasn't too hard to find um, overlapping sites, but we did coordinate with the DWR and CDFW sturgeon team. Um, and they helped us refine some of our site selection so that we could get better capture where they think a sturgeon are congregating. This picture on the right is some of the clams that we have collected and you can see they're really quite small. And even though they're small, um, there are certain populations of subsistence fishers that are collecting and eating these clams. And then as well as there is some evidence, maybe it's not the preferred food source, source but sturgeon are also consuming these organisms. So here is the map of our 10 different sites that we've chosen. The Northern Sacramento River sites, these we thought of as more likely to be kind of control sites, uh, less likely to have the cyanobacteria blooms and also um, used quite a bit by the sturgeon. So we're gonna be sampling for two years two times a month from the June to October period and once a month through November through May. Our focus is that we'll be collecting mussels from each of these 10 sites um, during all of those sampling dates and water samples. And then we're also opportunistically collecting crayfish. Um, the crayfish are not, we haven't had success at finding them at all of these sites, but we've found them so far at six of the 10 sites. So for the cyanotoxin, a focus of our project is looking at microcystin. So we'll be looking at that on every date and all of the organisms and water samples. And then we'll look at saxitoxin, three sampling dates per year. And we'll just be looking at the water and the shellfish, probably the mussels only. Uh, Tim Otten at Ben Genetics is running all of these samples with Eliza. And he's doing a, a freeze drying the mussels and then he's doing a methanol extraction. We're also, I should have mentioned, we're also working with Rafe Kudela at UC Santa Cruz, and he's gonna be running LCMS for us on a subset of the samples. He'll be looking at nine microcystin variants. And, and so this will help us identify specific microcystin variants uh, that are present in these mussels. And then for some of the lower level clams, uh, it will help us confirm that we are seeing true microcystin detections. Um, based on the quality control procedures that Tim has in place, he feels pretty confident that everything we're seeing is real, but there have been issues in the literature um, where ELISA can sometimes um, overestimate the amount of microcystin that's in uh, shellfish tissue. And so it'll be nice that we'll be able to confirm um, with a subset of samples that we're seeing true detections and then also being able to identify those variants. Uh, on an even smaller subset of samples, we'll be running the MMPB method, which will allow us to measure the total microcystin in the muscles, whereas the ELISA method, we're really only measuring that the freely available or the non-covalently bound microcystin. We're also collecting nutrients in our water samples, and I haven't had time to do any analysis on that, but we'll explore that further once we have more of a larger data set. So now I'm gonna get into the preliminary results. So we've had 10 sampling events so far, August, 2020 to February, 2021. And on the X axis here are um, the 10 different locations where we're sampling at and the microcystin here is micrograms per liter on the y-axis. And each of these box plots represents the 10 samples per site. So overall, I would say fairly low microcystin concentrations um, in the water samples, generally under four micrograms per liter, and generally well below that. Um, we are seeing lower concentrations at the SAC Sacramento River sites and the Cache Slough sites, 
and higher in the San Joaquin River, Middle River areas. We're also exploring the different genera that are present um, at each of these sites. And I wanna start by saying that these circles all represent, like the largest circles represent really low um, volumes of cells. And the teeny circles are very, very low. But um, the idea behind this is that we could just start to see what kind of genera are present. And these lightish blue circles are microcystis. And so you'll see that um, most of the time we're seeing microcystis, although there are a handful of other genera that are present. And then from November through February, we, we aren't really seeing any cells um, in the water samples. So these are uh, the clams. And so we're doing Asian clams for our study, C. fluminea. Once again, uh, the 10 sites here on the X axis and then micrograms microcystin and nanograms per gram on the y-axis. This red line indicates uh, the tolerable daily intake based on EPA's um, numbers. And we adjusted the number slightly to account for, um, work. they give a number in wet weight and we are presenting results in dry weight. So uh, we did some calculations and about 18 nanograms per gram is what was determined to be um, the threshold. And you can see that especially in the San Joaquin River and Middle River, Old River sites that we're seeing pretty high microcystin concentrations in the clams. Um, I zoomed in to take the highest uh, microcystin that was measured off of this plot because it was an extreme outlier and really distorting the plot. But at Frank's tract, one of the clams had over a thousand nanograms per gram of microcystin. So then I combined all sites and was curious what seasonal differences potentially were occurring. So we have the month that we've sampled so far here on the X axis. Um, and I think generally it would be expected that August is when you're having higher concentrations of toxin. And so it makes, makes sense that we're all seeing the highest concentration in the clams at that point, And it really starting to taper off. Um, we are having some slight detects in January and February, but they're not really showing up on this figure, but it does appear to be um, the microsystems persistent at least at some locations into the winter months. So this is the crayfish. We didn't have, we have 25 crayfish samples total. And so I, I wasn't really able to plot them out by site. Um, so I combined them all into this one box plot. And we had, you can see pretty high concentrations above that tolerable daily intake in our crayfish. Um, I also removed from this figure the highest, which was measured at San Joaquin River at Turner, Turner Cut where we had 1,700 nanograms per gram of microcystin in one of the crayfish. So our initial findings are that we're seeing the high microcystin concentration in Asian clams, particularly Frank's Tract and San Joaquin River, Middle River and Old River. We're seeing much lower concentrations um, up in Cashlew and the Sacramento River, which was what we hypothesized. Although high, highest microcystin concentrations are August, the toxins still persistent in January and February at some locations. We did run saxitoxin on a set of samples of clams in November and they were all non-detect. So we're planning to do our next set in June because that is where the preliminary um, data that we looked at from a different study indicated that the saxitoxin may be present. And then microcystis was the dominant genera. So future work, next steps is uh, we're about to send some samples over to UC Santa Cruz for that LCMS analysis. Um, we want to explore some of the associations between nutrients and toxin concentrations and the other field data. And then Ultimately, when this two-year study is done, we want to develop an inventory of microcystin accumulation in delta shellfish, uh, really focus in on the areas 
that have the highest benthic contamination um, and then define contamination of benthic prey organisms. Because there's no safe or unsafe toxin concentration for fish or sturgeon to consume, we're basically saying if the toxin is present, then it's potentially a stressor on the organism. Um, and when we do our final evaluation for human health, we'll rely on EPA and World Health Organization tolerable daily intake to make some conclusions. Okay, so that wraps up that section of the talk, but um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about another project that I'm working on with Tim Otten from Ben Genetics and um, Janice Cook from the Central Valley Water Board. And this is funding from SEP funding. And then there's also some state water board funding uh, for this project. So this is a project where we, um, we're hypothesizing that certain locations in the Delta may be the primary source of microcystis. Um, even though we see microcystis throughout the Delta during the summer, we're, we're thinking that perhaps there's just a couple of these key locations that are seeding the Delta. And so that was the purpose of this study. And these figures that I'm gonna put together are once again, just some very preliminary work. And um, Tim actually put these figures together. So this map shows where we're doing our work. We have um, six locations and um, we are hypothesizing that Stockton Waterfront and Discovery Bay are where a lot of the blooms in the Delta are seeding from. Um, but we're also interested in exploring um, Frank's Tract and the Mildred Island and then over here near Windmill Cove. We tried to go down to Vernalis, I'll talk about that in a minute, um, but we were not able to capture sediments with our sediment core there, it was just too rocky. And so we actually moved this Southern station up more into to this region. So um, in November and April, and so we've only conducted the November event so far, uh, we collected five sediment samples along a, the transect to determine site heterogeneity. So this figure shows actually seven dots, but um, we cut that down to five so that we could do some additional analysis. But basically the Central Valley Water Board goes out on the boat and they have a core and they try to core about in a circle these five sediment cores and then they bag them and bring them back uh, to the lab for analysis. And then um, two times a month in June and July of this year, after we do our April survey, we're gonna collect single sediment samples at each site and water samples to try to track um, where, the, where the cells are first entering the water column. So all the sediment samples are lyophilized. That actually wasn't the original plan, but the samples were coming back pretty wet and we just wanted to make sure um, that everything was treated equally across sites. And so um, Tim lyophilized all the samples and that worked well. We're using qPCR to quantify microcystis, looking both at total microcystis and then also at toxigenic microcystis. And then Tim, um, with those water samples, is going to do some DNA fingerprinting so that we can try to source track where these blooms are occurring. So this first figure, oh, I guess we did add in that map. I didn't put the most updated map in there. So we have seven sites, not six, like I said. But um, so this was comparing total microcystis across all sites. And uh, you can see here that we are seeing the highest concentrations at Windmill Cove, Mildred Island, and Discovery Bay, uh, lower at Stockton Waterfront, which was not what we were expecting. I mean, it's still high compared to like Buckley Cove and Frank's Tract, but quite a bit lower than Discovery Bay, for example. This is looking at the toxigenic microcystis. And similar story, um, highest concentrations at Discovery Bay, Mildred Ireland, and Stockton Waterfront. Okay, so this, there's a lot, 
going on in this slide, but these are the seven sites and the gray bars represent uh, the total microcystis and the red are the toxigenic. And what we're showing here is that there's quite a bit of heterogeneity across the different sites like Discovery Bay, for example, you're seeing, depending on where you're collecting those sediment cores, you're getting um, very different results for the number of resting cells that are down there. Um, but at the site, and this gray bar is actually an error that should be uh, down here lower. So at the sites where there's not as much, uh, so Rancho Del Rio and Frank's Tract, it, it is coming through as that. And the sites where you're seeing the highest cells, um, you're seeing a lot really high concentrations here at Discovery Bay. But um, it was interesting to note, we didn't expect it to be so different from each of the core samples. So preliminary summary, that was just that one sampling date that I presented to you. Lots of heterogeneity, uh, highest microcystis at Discovery Bay, Mildred Island, Windmill Cove, and those same locations had the highest toxigenic microcystis. And these are all the people that have helped with this project or had an integral role in the project and um, couldn't be done without the funding sources of uh, the Prop 1 and uh, some water board money and then also some of the SEP funding. So if anyone has questions on either of those projects, um, please let me know. I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, I'd like to open the floor up to questions for Ellen. That was a fascinating uh, set of presentations. Thank you, Ellen. Sue Kaidel has her hand raised. Thanks, uh, Ellen, that was, that was great. So from your experience, I have a couple questions for you. Um, do you feel like your Stockton sample caught, captured the deep water turning basin? Where we, yeah. Okay, so that, so then my question is one of the struggles that I know EPA has been thinking about for dealing with the Delta is how do you get a representative understanding of what's going on in the Delta? Because you've got areas with such high water volume and areas with very low water volume. You've looked at water, you've looked at um, shellfish, you've looked at sediment. How do we do sampling to understand what's happening in the various areas of the Delta, especially at a, to compare it with what's happening in other water bodies, you know, where we collect a water sample and say, oh, we've got, you know, toxic microsystem here. How, how do we capture the Delta accurately? Yeah, I mean, it's a hard, it's a difficult question because, um, I mean, that, that was one of the reasons for the source tracking was study is are we, can we focus in, for example, like some mitigation techniques on just a few select locations and would that help the Delta as a whole? Um, it just seems like you have, we have to have a lot of different sampling sites to capture um, what's going on in such a wide water body. And that includes some of those dead end channels, which is where we seem to see the greatest bloom issues, but then with the tidal exchange, it just seems to be dispersing those cells so that when you're out there in the summer, you're seeing cells all over the place. And do you think water is the appropriate thing to be sampling? Well, the shellfish, um, you know, some people have suggested that the shellfish could be good indicators potentially. Um, and I know that there's an effort and I haven't been able to attend these meetings. So maybe you all know more about this, but I know there's some spat samplers out there, which, um, you know, are better at not just capturing these discrete events like we were doing with our water graph samples. And so that could perhaps tell a greater story. Um, I, I think it's a combination of different methods, really. Using different uh, field met based methods and then sampling across wide areas until we get a better handle of where these blooms are originating from. Great, thank you. Um, Ellen, I, I had a question about the, in, in the first presentation, you were 
you mentioned an 18 nanograms per gram, and I'm wondering where that number came from as a, was that some form of some sort of action level or? Yeah, it was, um, I, I could send to you, there was a calculation that we did to come up with that. It was based on the EPA's number, and then we assumed um, a 90% um, wet weight removal from the clams. And so, um, Based on the calculation, uh, we came up with 18 nanograms per gram for the dry weight. Dry weight, okay. And I could send you, uh, we have a little paragraph written up on it that probably would explain it a little bit better. Yes, yeah, that sounds interesting. We've done a, um, a fish and shellfish uh, microcystin um, testing over here at Clear Lake a few years ago. And we're, you know, we're seeing some, I guess not not numbers as high as in the thousands, but um, certainly we're seeing numbers that were above the the recommended action level that OEHA has set for sports fish consumption, uh, and I believe that was 10 nanograms per gram for microcystin. So interested in your study? We'll keep keep an eye out for it. Okay, and we did when we used that number, we said ours was a very, we felt like it was a very conservative. Uh, number. And so it, I, I guess I didn't realize that OEHA had the 10 nanograms per gram, but that could be um, a better number to use. Yeah, I don't know if Be Becky's on. I don't know if there's anything you might want to say about that, Becky. Um, no, I just if, if there's any question or you need a link, just let me know. Um, but it's on our page. I was actually going to ask about, um, I'd be curious how salinity changes in the delta um, over those areas might affect um, at least the, you know, dissolved versus uh, intracellular fractions of these uh, cyanotoxins. Um, if we're hitting anything above their, uh, their thresholds, um, I don't know that's something I put the USGS link in there too, because I know that's something I think they're doing the high resolution mapping for. Um, so I'd just be curious how those overlap. Yeah, we're collecting a suite of field parameters that I also didn't mention or have time um, to report on, look through the data, but that we'll have to connect all of that as well to our results, which might help uh, provide some insight for helping figure out long-term sampling locations. Ellen, this is Sue again. How much longer are you going to be able to keep sampling? And I'm wondering if you're going to be able to get a full year of sediment cores to kind of see maybe if what you're seeing in the sediments is temporal. Yeah, so the reason I didn't explain this well, but the reason we did November for our first date is um, we anticipated that should be when sediment has the highest um, cell counts because the blooms should mostly be out of the water column and settled down into the sediment, but we haven't yet had the precipitation event to move a lot of water through. And then we're doing the second event in April because um, that's after it should be drying out. We shouldn't have any more, uh, well, it's hard, impossible to predict, but we shouldn't have any major precipitation events. And so at that point, we're saying, okay, the the floors have been scoured as much as they would during the winter. And so what's what's left behind now, we're expecting um, to see much lower concentrations of the cells, particularly in the more like open channel areas. Um, and then, so those are the only, we only have funding for those two events where we'll be able to do the five sediment samples per site. And then we're just doing the single samples a couple times in June and July to try to track a little bit more of the movement. You know, we view this as um, the whole study is kind of a preliminary study. The idea is that we'd like to do a more intensive um, approach to this project, more long-term, more samples. And then at one time we had talked with RMA about doing some modeling so that we could better track um, our findings with how water is flowing through the Delta and just get a better sense of how the cells are being dispersed. And so, um, if some of our hypotheses come true from this project that we are truly uh, seeing more cells and at like Discovery Bay and Stockton waterfront and that we're seeing 
nearly none at those other locations after the winter rains, then I think it would be interesting to spend some more time looking at this study or a more comprehensive version of this study. It looks like Dave Karen has his hand up. Dave? Yes. Um, hi, Alan. Uh, I had a couple questions. Uh, the, the first one was the uh, maybe an easy one um, from the 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 um, part where you talked about the crayfish. One of the crayfish was like out the roof with toxin. Any idea on on what's going on with that particular? On the size of that one, maybe. Um, yeah. That's a good question. That's something I haven't had time to explore either, and I didn't really mention it in my talk, but we are keeping track of the size classes. And um, for the mussels in particular, we're actually going to be able to do some size class comparison of small versus large mussels, not every date, not every site, but when we have enough. Um, and so we are going to explore if there's relationship to of organism size to toxin concentration. Uh, it is interesting to note that preliminary results indicate that the smaller clams have higher toxin concentrations than the larger clams. Um, I can't speak to crayfish at this point, though. Yeah, uh, that, that was just an enormously large number, that one that was way off the charts there. Yeah. Um, the other question that I had, I guess, that I found the, um, you know, the information on, on I know you, you've proposed your two hot sites for where the the microcystins are getting going in Stockton and Discovery Bay and, and that certainly makes sense um, from what I've seen. I guess the question I have though is would you necessarily think that the the starter points if there are hot spots which are then materials being disseminated or, or transported from there would necessarily be the high spots uh, in terms of abundances or even microcystin concentration because you I mean if you've got a hot spot that's sort of spewing off um, populations that are then moving around because of circulation and, and cooking as they do so, you might expect that the, the highest concentrations are going to be in areas of accumulation rather than in areas of source. Have you thought about that? Um, no, that's an interesting point. Um, well, two things, it seems like both of those locations are also where we're seeing highest concentrations. But I think the idea is that we are thinking that those other locations would get scoured out enough potentially during the winter months that even if there were high concentrations of blooms, maybe the sediments would move around enough to move those cells out of the system. Um, that's yet to be seen. I think also something that makes this difficult is that you have little pocket areas you know, that are not these large areas that can also have these high concentrations of blooms and they're fairly well protected. And so it's true that you're not going to have the flushing like you are in the main channels. And so how does that impact uh, the load into the deltas this is also yet to be seen. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I think of Discovery Bay with its little system of, of sort of, you know, one way valves. There's, the residence time there has got to be quite high relative yeah. to residence times in other areas. Um, whether that's important or not, I don't know, but it's, I, I guess it's, I know it's a really complicated pattern. It's great to see you trying to take that on. Yeah, yeah, this is definitely some first little steps at, at trying to explore this, but um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what we find. And I think the ability for Tim to do this DNA fingerprinting will also help confirm some of our results because it will help us um, feel more, it'd be more than just looking at what's in the sediment, right? It'll allow us to kind of connect what we're seeing in the sediment to the water column. Thanks, great talks. We've got a question from Rich Fatness, followed by Keith. Rich, are you there? You're muted if you're trying to speak. Well, while he's get, getting, oh, Rich, are you there? Uh, let me ask a question while he's getting himself unmuted, Ellen. Um, with the crayfish, are you homogenizing the whole um, uh, crayfish or is it, are you pulling the tissue out? Uh, we're pulling the tissue out. 
Okay. All right, great. Um, uh, this is Tim. Ellen, uh, we're doing the tissue and, and the guts on the, on the crayfish. Tissue and Because guts. the expectation was with the clams, we're not like separating the stomach or whatever they have from the tissue. If you're eating the whole thing and this isn't only for human exposure, it's also like sturgeon and things. And so it's basically whatever tissue we can scoop out and leave in the carapace behind that gets homogenized and, and then freeze dried. But no shell. Yeah, no shell. But I mean, the fact that the guts are in the crayfish is likely part of why those are pretty high. And this, the tails would probably be less. And so we had to make that call if we wanted to only look at the tail meat or kind of look at the whole organism. Yeah, but if people are consuming it and they're throwing whole, you know, crayfish into a pot, then it seems like it would work. Yeah, potentially, yeah, like a, a crab boil or whatever, a crayfish boil. Right, the water also been shown to have high concentrations of toxin in soups. All right, Rich, are you uh, available? Uh, let's see, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Great. Sorry, I had three unmute buttons I had to push in order to, get to speak. Um, way I'm hooked up on my phone for some reason, but anyway, uh, I had two thoughts. And one, uh, in the second project, you were talking about the idea of perhaps using spats. Uh, as a sampler. And what we found in region one, where we did a lot of water grabs and a lot of spat sampling, and everything else, is that the water grabs themselves were really, most were like non detect or very low detect. But in the spats, we're able to actually look at for that transition as they start to bloom out and everything else. So by putting the spats out there for, say, a week or so, you actually get a more accurate record, I believe, an accurate record of how. Um, your toxins are increasing over time or decreasing over time. So you can get a relative idea of what's going on with those. They're not um, quantitative, but they are qualitative. Or the other way, not qualitative, they are quantitative. I get those mixed up all the time. Um, the other thing is um, the idea of, you were talking about how in muscle tissue and everything else, the ELISA may actually overestimate the microsystem. And one of the thoughts there would be the idea of modularin, because ELISA picks up modularin, whereas if you went with the, with, went with the LCMS, it does not. And what we found in Region 1 in the rivers here is that there's a lot of modularin, believe it or not. And yeah, and you, when you see... Sa oh, go on. Well, just, go ahead. I was going to say, when um, Rafe Cudella runs the samples at UC Santa Cruz, he will be... Um, doing the microsystem variants and nodularin. And so if that right. is in fact um, nodularin present, then that he would help us be able to sort that out. Perfect, yeah, because what we because he did our work too. And what we were seeing was, you know, at times nodularin was, uh, was considerably higher than microcystin. And so when we were doing the ELISA test, it kind of, it, it made sense. And um, just to clarify, we are we are not doing any spat sampling uh, for either of these projects. I was just mentioning that I know that is um, something that there are some spat samplers out in the delta right now that people are tracking. And I don't I don't know a lot about what they're doing with that or how frequently they're out there. I was just saying that I know there's some of that work being done. All right, we've got time for one last question uh, with Keith, if you can make it really quick. We've got to transition to the next one by 1040. Go ahead, Keith. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the, um, the molecular fingerprinting methods. Um, I know Tim had that paper um, out of the Klamath where he was tracking um, strains downstream um, in the river. And um, I think that those types of methods are, are fabulous and really provide a lot of information and insight. So I'm excited to hear that's a part of it. And I um, was just curious if you could add any more details about what the plan is um, for that aspect. Well, and since Tim's on, maybe we, we don't have as much funding as we um, had originally hoped for for this project. So that's that will be a small component of this, but it will allow us to at least explore it. And Tim, maybe you should answer that question. Yeah, so the, some previous work we've done on the on the Delta, we know that this this method wouldn't work if you only had like one or two strains of microcystis, you know, in the system. But there's evidence for anywhere from six to ten or more strains of microcystis, and so by sequencing either 16S or phycocyanin genes, we can look for 
uh, SNP patterns, so the single nucleotide polymorphisms that are representative of the different strains and based on the abundance of the strain profiles in each sample. So if we have like, you know, Discovery Bay is predominantly this one variant and, you know, you would expect to see if there's connectivity in, in along temporal gradients uh, nearby adjacent sampling sites, you would, if they're being fed from that, you'd expect to see that, that, that same variant being dominant there, but if you have completely different profiles, then it would suggest that there isn't this uh, feeding or connectivity from the sites. And so it's, it would be better to have like a higher frequency of samples because, you know, there's lag time involved in, in everything for the transport. But um, yeah, so the idea is kind of see what, what you see at the water column is that what we're seeing in the sediment, because you can have eight strains laying in the sediment, but only one is recruiting to the water. Um, and, you know, at any given time, you know, because there's booming bus cycles. And so just trying to get a handle, um, part of this might be preliminary. And if there's enough uh, interest in going forward, then maybe this ends up being another study where we take what we learned and expand upon it. But that's the idea. All right. Thank you. Uh, great presentation, Ellen, and some great questions that came from it. Really looking forward to watching that. Um, as, as, it, uh, as you publish and get more information. Uh, and if you'd like to come back at a future CC Hab meeting to give us an update, that would be wonderful. Sure. Thank you. I'd love to. Thank you. All right, we're going to move into two sets, uh, two presentations. Uh, the first starting with Angela de Palma Dow from uh, Lake County Water Resources Department. And Angela, can you share a screen now? Does that use to have that ability? Not yet. All right, Dave. Um, oh, I there just, we go. I just Got made it. her co-host. Yep, should be good. Does yeah. that work? Can you guys see that? Yes. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Angela. Awesome. Great. Thank you guys so much for um, having me here this morning. Um, yes, thanks for the introduction, Sarah. So I'm Angela De Palma Dow. I'm um, from Lake County Water Resource Department. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, we, we had a large record-breaking fire in 2018 and we wanted to figure out the impacts of that fire on Clear Lake. So this project started off as a deep dive into that fire and the impacts on our lake and then once we got into it we figured out the obviously the um, story is much more complex and so today I'm going to present um, a little bit of uh, the results on that of uh, this complexity with implications for managing wildfire and climate change impacts on a long-term phosphorus in large shallow hypereutrophic lake. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, my co-authors, Ian, who's gonna be following up my talk um, with um, his own, and then uh, Jenny Brunchup from University of Vermont, and also our funders. Um, and they're all here listed on the, the right-hand side there. All right, so for those of us that managing water bodies in California, um, there is a fire risk consistently every year, but there is um, limited data and research available for impacts of wildfire on lakes, particularly for these temperate Mediterranean ecosystems out here in the West. So even though over the last 30 years, fire presence has increased um, and there's been a lot more fire exposure, higher fire severities, more occurrence, the research is still catching up. There's a lot that we don't know, particularly with research and information that's available on lakes, ponds, and wetlands. And so this makes it very hard, like I said, for managers of say Lake County, where we manage Clear Lake, where we've had fires consistently over the last like six or seven years, we've had a fire in our watershed in our county. Um, and particularly I talked about the Mendocino complex and, and that was in 2018. But over the last five or six years, we've had about half of our county has burned. Um, the Mendocino complex was what burned about 40% of our watershed that uh, flows into Clear Lake. And in general, to give you some background about our county, we're, we're relatively poor. We're disadvantaged county, basically, even though our county gets about 60% of its drinking water is sourced from Clear Lake. Um, and because we have had so many fires over so many years that our um, recovery efforts, being able to really take time and understand what's going on with fire impacts on our aquatic resources, is stifled because we have a new fire every year that, that comes and um, overlaps and interferes with that, those recovery efforts. And then give you some background on Clear Lake. We're the largest freshwater natural lake in the state. Our, we're, relative, we're very shallow, so our mean depth is only 27 feet, but there's been um, water or lake here for at least half a million years. 
Um, and because of that, you know, long-term sediments, we have um, a very rich nutrient bank. And so we're a green lake, we have lots of algae, and we have lots of cyanobacteria blooms, as, as you're aware. Um, and we do have a nutrient TMDL because it is a 303D impaired water body, uh, particularly for sediment phosphorus. So our research question going into this was what is predicting these water quality conditions in Clear Lake? With our first uh, assumption being, is it wildfire? And then is it climate? Is there rain impacts, drought? Maybe there's some processes like anoxic, hypoxic occurrence um, that's coinciding with some of these nutrient enrichment issues or blooms. And so, you know, in this group, we all know that algae, cyanobacteria is a product of nutrient enrichment. And for Clear Lake in particular, phosphorus has been identified as that target nutrient that's driving these um, cyanobacteria blooms and just algae conditions in general in our lake. And this is important for us because as managers, we have to have the best information to make sound management decisions and figure out what really is impacting these water quality conditions so we can implement um, those uh, best management practices and um, strategic efforts. So the data that we used is listed here. We use state data. We use data derived from our TMDL program. Uh, we use PRISM climate data, CAL FIRE FRAP data, and then we use some spatial data from the Lagos um, uh, database. And, and Ian will talk a little bit about that in his talk following mine. So here are the Clear Lake sample locations. And I just wanna make it very clear, at least for Clear Lake, we are a three basin lake. And it has been shown that each of these basins has their own kind of identity, whether it's topography, wind impacts, they all have different depths. So not only are we dealing with you know, these impacts of wildfire and climate, but we're also kind of having to study these uh, spatial intricacies within our own lake, as well as the impacts over time and some of those temporal um, changes. So we look at wildfire history around Clear Lake. We have a long history of wildfire in our watershed. Um, and when you look at this, you know, we have uh, the year along the X axis and the proportion of watershed burned. And what you can kind of see is prior to very, um, strategic fire management strategies, uh, there was a lot of little fires in our watershed. And then they've kind of tapered off and then we have several few larger fires. Um, and our water quality data starts about 1968. So you can see that the beginning part of um, that millennium, we didn't really have that much water quality data at all. And this makes it hard because this data then is skewed, right? So if we're looking at this individual lake system, we have um, the skewed data. So it makes it really hard for us to see fire and then impact. But what we can do is pick out some fires that we have had within our water quality um, sampling monitoring period. So we have these three fires here and they happen to be some of the largest fires in the watershed that we looked at some data pre and post to see if there was an in impact. So that's what this um, box plot chart is showing here. So we picked a fire from 1981 1996, and then 2018 was our Mendocino complex. And this is um, surface total phosphorus from all of our arms, the upper, the lower, and the oaks arm. And what we did is we looked at three year of pre-fire data and three year post-fire data for the total phosphorus water quality. And of course, 2020 <laughs> was COVID and we had a bunch of um, funding issues. So we actually don't have data a lot for 2020 for the, the largest fire on record, which again is a complexity and makes it pretty difficult as a manager for us to kind of gauge impact of one of the largest fires on our lake. In general though, when we look at this, we're not seeing those large post-fire increases in TP, right? So there's either no change or there's a decrease in these three years post-fire. Um, of course, we still have to wait for some 2021 data for this Mendocino post-fire um, impacts. But in general, you know, it is limited, but we're not seeing these large increases that we would expect after fire, at least when it comes to phosphorus. Um, and in general, let's just remember that few water bodies out there have pre and post monitoring data. We are one of the ones here that has some of that as well as multiple fires that we can put along with that water quality data. So this is very difficult for water managers to be able to look through records and see the impact of fire on water quality because the data is so limited. So there's another way that we can look at this by kind of looking over time and looking at related variables to phosphorus. So for example, we have um, uh, total suspended solids, total phosphorus, and then chlorophyll A that we've been monitoring in this lake since um, 2004. And so we can look at this over time and then 
put our Mendocino fire ignition, this is the largest fire we had in this time period, um, to kind of see are there any changes pre and post of, of that large fire for these variables that are all pretty much correlated together, they have some association. And again, we talked about data skew. This is very skewed. We have 15 year pre-fire, and then we only have one and a, uh, one and a quarter year post-fire data. So what real conclusions that we can, we can use to manage this resource with this kind of skewed data, right? Um, and then of course, making that even more muddy and complicated um, is that there were some things going on during these time periods before and after the fire that make the story even less clear. So outlined in the yellow, that was, we had a, a big drought year, uh, several years. So 2012, 2016, we had a big drought year. So there were some of these increases in these variables in the lake before the fire. And then after the fire, we had a big flood year. So we had a lot of dilution. We didn't see an impact. We had a lot of water in our lake, fresh rainwater. So these things make that picture very difficult to tease out and see exactly what's going on. And this is real life stuff that managers are having to contend with and they're trying to figure out nutrient dynamics and the impacts on HABs in their lake. So for this, with what we've been able to put together with the data we have available, we can kind of say at least right now, we can't see an apparent wildfire impacts, at least for phosphorus. Um, and maybe it's the nature of our lake, which is large, eutrophic, it's shallow. Maybe some of those uh, features override any impacts we could see from wildfire. Um, and then we do have these legacy nutrient impacts that again, might be overshadowing some of what we're seeing um, in this lake. And so we're, we do need to look outside of Clear Lake to see impacts of wildfire. And Ian's gonna be touching on that in his talk. But there's other things that we need to consider um, outside of just impacts of wildfire on HABs and um, phosphorus, particularly when we're looking at drinking water. So like I said, Clear Lake is a drinking water source for about 60% of our county, very important. Um, and they are already at the top of using all of their tools for managing Clear Lake for um, <coughs> bacteria and HABs in their treatment systems. So when we're talking about Clear Lake treatment resiliency in the presence of wildfire, we have partners at Washington State University that are really interested in getting their hands on Clear Lake and wildfire impacts and be able to help us figure out how do we deal with these, um, these impacts in our drinking water systems here in Clear Lake. So Clear Lake has 17 water purveyors, uh, public and private, in addition to many individual small intake systems. And there is impacts of long-term post-fire ash accumulation and burn sediments that can have complications when um, conducting treatments uh, for drinking water. So, and I'm not a drinking water <laughs> purveyor, so I apologize if I make this up, but um, that's why we have a partner from Washington uh, State to help us. But when you have total organic carbons are increased after fires, which we can see here, there's several large spikes um, on this graph on the right after these wildfire events, we have these large spikes of total organic carbon. Um, these are HAA5 precursors, and those are basically haloacetic acids, and they're disinfection byproducts. So it's the process of being able to disinfect the water for drinking water. And over time, these can cause cancer if they're used a lot. So if you have a lake like Clear Lake, we've had a lot of fires, we have a lot of drinking water um, treatment plants on the lake, and there is the risk of having these in, in the process of treatments for these post-fire uh, total organic carbon accumulations is increased risk of cancer. Now this is, we don't have a lot of information on this, this isn't studied. And again, our partners are really trying to look into this and use Clear Lake as a uh, study source to be able to dive into this further. And particularly we're starting with looking at a regional perspective of impacts of uh, wildfire on um, lakes and streams that are drinking water or irrigation water sources. So we just applied for a 2021 Delta Science Research Grant um, with partners from Washington State, UC Davis, you see Extension, Sonoma, and Yolo, and Lake County is a co-PI. And what we're doing is looking at all of this region in the Delta headwaters. Um, if you look at the map on the right, all the red is fires on this landscape in the last 10 years. And our study sites are gonna be in Clear Lake, Indian Valley, and then all of these um, tributaries um, that flow down into the, the headwaters. And the specific goal of this is to address knowledge gaps surrounding wildfire impacts on lakes in the Delta watershed. And I bring this up to the group here today because one of our specific tasks of this grant is to perform analysis and synthesis of wildfire, water quality, char leachate, and HAB data. So we're incorporating HAB information from these streams and lakes and water bodies to try to figure out and address these knowledge gaps with the impacts of wildfire on, um, on, on these aquatic resources. So 
right now we can't, you know, have any definitive answer that wildfires having impact at least on these on nutrients. Maybe there's something else going on in our lake uh, that's driving some of these cyanobacteria um, blooms um, or conditions. So we're looking at anoxia hypoxia conditions. So what we can do is we have this long-term data set. We can look at DO over time. So here we have DO on surface and bottom. Um, and again, these are selected for months where we see bloom occurrence. So between July and October, of course, I know Sarah, we're seeing blooms as early as right now, um, but over to, over these years that we have this data, we're, we're picking out, selecting those months. Um, and then we've also identified in here time periods or the target limit for hypoxic conditions and anoxic conditions when there's low DO and when there's no DO. And for an example, let's just look at the Oaks arm, one of our arms, and then we can look at have the occurrence of uh, anoxic hypoxia changed over time. So of all of our sampling points, when are the conditions anoxic and has that changed really over this time period of monitoring? Um, and we look at it, we basically have two kind of um, uh, groups of data. So 64 to 91, about 4% um, uh, of those total samples had anoxic days or was it anoxic uh, event. And between 98 and 2019, we saw 3.4%. So the amount of time this lake is in an anoxic occurrence has not really changed over time. So that's something that we have to consider that may not be kind of driving or, or relating to what's going on with these, um, these conditions. And anoxia is important because we do know that that can cause fish kills and other issues in, in lakes. So are nutrients even increasing in this lake? Yes, we look at total phosphorus. Yes, we are seeing that between, um, with all of our samples over time, July, October, we are seeing these annual rate of increase, particularly when we look at the 80s and on, we have those um, increases in, in phosphorus in this lake in all of our arms. Um, so that leads us to a question, you know, is there impacts maybe from climate change? And as a manager, this is very concerning because the variables that are associated with climate change are not things that I can manage as a manager for a lake. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that we did um, have a case study in the California's fourth climate change assessment from the Natural Resources Agency. Uh, where we talked about this and how the impacts of climate change, especially on HAB prevalence and, and HAB severity, um, might overshadow all of the past, current, and future efforts for managers to be able to manage this problem in this lake. Um, and these are things that could be like surface uh, temperature increases, which we do see in Clear Lake for the summer surface temps. But are these really what's associated with our increases in, in total phosphorus? When we, we look at that, not really, we're not seeing those increased temperatures also uh, associated with our, our phosphorus. What we're actually seeing is the lack of rain during those winter months. So like this winter, this winter and last winter, we had very little rain. Those are the time periods that we're actually then seeing those increases in phosphorus in our lake. And so what does this all mean? We kind of put it all together um, and it's kind of, you know, makes common sense that when we have these drought periods where we have less rain, we have warmer temperatures, not only are these conditions set up for wildfire and HABs, but they're also where we're seeing these large nutrient increases in our lake. And we don't have a really great record of um, keeping track of drought or defining drought, but this uh, publication um, from the Department of Water Resources from the state actually did identify severe droughts in California for these years. And we look at that over our phosphorus trend data, we do see that multi-year increases of phosphorus coincided with drought periods, identified drought periods. Um, and so these are things we have to look at as a manager, we're going into another drought, we can start preparing the public for probably increases in phosphorus, increases in blooming, blooming time. There are events of blooms. So what's the take home message for this? And there was a lot in there. Um, but the legacy of Clear Lake, of our nutrients and other impacts, and then the future legacy of climate change make it really hard for us to isolate the impacts of wildfire on this lake. But it's really important that we keep studying this and we dedicate resources and effort because there is a drinking water treatment resiliency need. We have to figure out how to accommodate and um, safely treat these post-fire drinking water resources. And then of course for nutrient have management, how do we manage HABs when we're seeing these impacts of wildfires that are unknown as well as climate change that are things that we can't manage. So we need to really use these large scale studies and we have to collaborate with researchers and other managers. And Ian's gonna talk about this a little bit in his next talk, but 
Um, you know, if we can't get information from our one lake, we have to reach out. We have to look at lakes collectively over a larger scale, over a larger landscape to kind of really pinpoint what is going on. What's the common factors with wildfire and water quality? And then of course, those climate conditions that increase both wildfire, phosphorus and um, HAB conditions, how do we separate them all, right? They all kind of need the same things to, um, to, to occur and to increase, but how do we tease them apart? And as a manager, that's a question I ask, how do I identify a single thing? Um, and then managers, we have to consider everything. So, you know, this is only a very small snapshot of research that's going on in Clear Lake. Um, we are working with, uh, UC Davis is also looking at um, some co-limitation. So what are the ratios of nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon in this lake? And what do those have to do with, with the conditions that we're seeing? And then the county is working with UC Davis to look at some sediment flux. So we have been taking sediment cores since um, 20, oh, 2006 or two, 2011. We have a longer term um, data set for sediment cores. And then um, we're trying to piece that up with, with water column conditions with UC Davis. And then we have to continue monitoring. So we actually just lost a lot of funding from the state for monitoring. That's the burden on the county. So the amount of money, resources, effort available for us to manage our resource, we now are just offsetting and putting into monitoring the resource. So that's even less resources for us available to manage any of these um, uh, resources. Okay, that was a lot. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'll take any questions if there's time. Um, and I'm really looking forward to Ian's talk. He's gonna talk a little broader um, about wildfire and lake impacts. Thank you, Angela. Yes, there are a few minutes for questions if people would like to unmute themselves and ask. Sue's got her hand raised. Go ahead, Sue. Thanks, Angela. That was great. A really naive question. What is it about drought years that's causing phosphorus to increase? Is it as simple as no dilution or is there something else going on? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so I, again, I only have really clear lake to kind of look at, but for our lake, we don't have a, a water level structure that controls water level. So there's a natural feature that water can just flow out at its, at its natural pace. Um, so we have a limited water level. Um, and I, I believe in our case that dilution is the solution for our lake. Um, so, you know, we, we get a lot of rain during those big heavy wet years. Uh, we have flood events, the whole shoreline floods, people get water in their, in their backyards. Um, and we have a lot of water. We have a lot of, of fresh rainwater that kind of flushes out the system for that whole year. Um, and we see drastic changes um, with our, you know, nuisance aquatic plants, with water clarity, as well as with um, occurrence with, with blooms. We still have blooms um, and we still have algae, it's still green, um, but that's, I kind of think is the, is the tie, but we, we have to dig into that a little more and that then, you know, morphs that water quantity and water quality aspect. And I know UC Davis is doing some modeling um, for that, including both of those aspects and other complexity. Um, into there as well. That's what I think personally. Um, and yeah, that's what I would think. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. Uh, looks like uh, there's a question in the chat from Stephen McCord. Angela, is there any signal observed in the lake bed sediments from fires? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we have not been able to analyze the pre and post data yet for those sediments for the fire, um, but we do have that. So we have sediments, we have phosphorus and nitrogen um, in uh, analysis from sediments taken from three locations, those same locations in the lake. Um, and we have it for pre and post fire, and we have not yet been able to analyze that. Um, but yes, that is a question that we're looking at. Um, and part of that nutrient flux or the sediment flux efforts with UC Davis, I'm hoping we'll kind of tease out some of that. Um, but if anybody's interested in that, I'm hoping also Washington State has some plans to look at some um, uh, look at that data with us, as well as some some tracing within the landscape and then into the sediments in the lake to see how those are actually mobilizing and moving through the, the landscape into the lake sediments. Uh, Keith had his hand raised. Go ahead, Keith. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. That was great. You, you've done so much work work up there. It's really amazing. Um, the two questions, two questions I had. Um, one is relating to scale. A lot of your impacts were focused on like annual scales. And I was curious if you've thought about more of that 
weekly or monthly scale as a fire has um, you know, just ended and what the impact of, of ash, smoke, um, and other like particle deposition from, um, from the fire might be having on the water. And then, um, so that, that's one question. Second one is um, if there's been any monitoring of streams and um, that are flowing into the lake and if there's groups like CDFW or others are generating data sets that um, have been useful or you think might be useful in the future to help understand the loading into lake um, after fire. So I know you see as USGS has been doing some um, post fire work in the streams um, and we had some post fire stream data. The thing that makes the stream data difficult is you don't really know where in the landscape you're gonna get a fire. So of course you monitor your most important streams, right? Cause you don't have funds or staff to monitor every stream. And then you, you know, if you get a fire, do you then go and monitor where that downstream of that fire, which then you have a stream you're monitoring, but you don't have that pre data. So you can monitor that stream and actually get an idea of, you know, what's occurring post fire, but then you don't, can't compare with that pre day. I don't know what those, um, that information is for the baseline. Um, and so this is a common problem that we're, we're seeing and why we really rely on these larger scale landscape studies where we can put stream and lake data together. And there has been a lot of research done on streams and fire more than lakes. Um, so yeah, it's very difficult. You can't predict where fire is gonna be. And when you're a uh, rather poor county like us, <laughs> You, can, you really have to maximize your resources and figure out where you should monitor to manage your resource. It makes it very hard because you can't predict that fire and you can't you know, see the future and see like, well, maybe we should put a monitoring station over here because there's gonna be a fire there. So that kind of muddies all that. So it makes it hard to answer and address that question um, and those, those issues, Keith. But thank you though. <laughs> Um, Angela, there's one last question in the chat, and then we're going to move to Ian's presentation. Um, that question is, is there a correlation between timber harvesting and loss of older nearby forests to the increases in water temperature over time? You know, I don't know that. Um, so being able to correlate forest land cover, I believe that's, you know, there is going to be some look at that with a um, watershed model that I know UC Davis and USGS are doing. They're going to be looking at the change in land cover over time. Um, uh, we tried to look at burn severity, you know, small, medium, and or low, medium, and high burn severity and impact on um, the water quality in the lake. And with one lake, with one sample, like one location, that makes it very, very difficult. It's something, again, we have to look at a broader scale to piece that out. Um, but no, we have not worked on anything with forest data. Um, frankly, I think our, our lake is way too large for anything to kind of have that impact for temperature for, for forests. Thank you, Angela, and thank you for that presentation. Um, we're going to uh, move into the next presentation with Ian McCullough, uh, Research Associate, uh, Data Intensive Landscape Limnology Lab from Michigan State University. I did want to also point out that our subcommittee reports were actually starting at 11.30. I'm sorry I did not um, mention that at the beginning of the meeting, and that's what's allowing for some questions after these two presentations. The subcommittee reports are going to be 15 minutes instead of 25 minutes, so just alerting everybody about that. We'll be starting those at 11.30. All right, Ian, uh, looks like you've got your presentation up, and please go ahead. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Angela. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone else, for, for being here and listening to today. So, I'm Ian McCullough. I'm, uh, is this going? I'm a California trained landscape ecologist, and I'm currently a postdoc at Michigan State, where I've been since 2017. I've done work on forests, lakes, fire, and climate, and uh, hopefully, I think that that perspective can be useful in, this, in the context of what you're interested in. So I think a lot of what we heard about Clear Lake is really an important piece of a larger puzzle in terms of thinking about fire impacts on aquatic systems. So we think about what we learned from Clear Lake. We have not yet seen immediate impacts of wildfire on Clear Lake water quality. And that includes this very large 2018 Mendocino complex. It appears that climate is a greater driver of long-term total phosphorus than fire. And if anything, this has all just reinforced the importance of long-term monitoring data in these systems with a lot of fire. But we still have very 
we still have a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to lakes and other aquatic ecosystems in fire. Why haven't fires affected Clear Lake water quality? Is it because the lake is too large and eutrophic? Or have we just not yet observed the effects or maybe we don't have the data from 2020? So I think there's a couple of possible solutions to address these unanswered questions. One is just to keep monitoring Clear Lake, particularly under a, a future with increasing fire activity. But another thing we can do is we can look to other systems for clues. And I think actually, hopefully we can do both of these things at once, but I'm gonna to speak to this second option today. So in my lab at Michigan State, we actually study all the lakes in the continental US, all 480,000 of them. So I think there's a good chance that some of these have experienced fire over the years and not just Clear Lake. So hopefully we can use those, those other case studies as ways to learn about fire impacts on lakes. And this graphic here, so it should start playing. Um, let's see. Nope. Okay, well, this actually was supposed to animate um, showing the extent of wildfire from 1984 to 2015. And what it would show is that wildfire actually is well spread out across the continent of the US and not just something we see in the, uh, the West. We also see quite a bit in places like Florida, the Southern Great Plains, the Midwest. So the, the point here is that there are many opportunities to study fire impacts on lakes across the continent of the U.S. And as Angela mentioned, there's uh, this review paper that we did where we basically just looked at past studies that have looked at fire effects on lakes to see what we can learn from these moving forward. So one of the first things we found is that there is this increasing exposure of lakes to fire in the continental US. So this figure shows from 1984 to 2015, an overall increase in fire activity in US lake watersheds, particularly due to wildfire, which are those red bars, and particularly since the mid 2000s or so. And in total, this amounted to 21,500 lakes with at least one watershed fire between 1984 and 2016. So here are just some fun statistics that I thought would be, would be fun to share. So the states that experienced, that had the states with the most lakes that experienced fire were actually Florida. No one ever gets that when I asked them to guess. Minnesota, Texas, California came at number four, and then Kansas at number five. And then if we correct for the number of lakes per state, so the states with the highest percentage of lakes that experienced fires over this period, Idaho, Arizona, Kansas, Nevada, Florida, and then California came in at number eight with 15% of its lakes having experienced at least one fire between 1984 and 2015. And then what we can do is actually map out fire history in all of these U.S. lake watersheds. So what I didn't mention earlier when I showed that map of all the lakes that we study in the U.S., we actually have been mapping the watersheds for all these lakes as well. So therefore, using these um, fire records that we get from that graphic that I tried to show you, we can then calculate fire histories for all U.S. lake watersheds over the period from 84 to the present. So what this map shows is um, every dot represents a lake watershed. And the larger and more colored dots represent a higher proportion of that watershed that was burned, whereas the gray dots represent unburned watersheds. So essentially what you're seeing here is that there's quite a bit of fire activity in lake watersheds across the US, in the West, but also in places as I mentioned like Florida, Southern Great Plains, and quite a bit in the Midwest as well. So with this, there's an opportunity it's potentially to study a very wide range of ecosystem responses to fire in a, a diverse set of ecological conditions. So what we did in our review is look for physical, chemical, and biological effects of fire on lakes. And in this, we uncovered 14 published studies. So actually not that many. So in terms of physical effects of fire on lakes, right? Generally, we found declines in light availability and water clarity, and they mostly attributed this to increases in DOC. 
Generally, we found deeper thermoclines and more stable stratification in large lakes as a result of fire, but in small lakes, wind mixing and unstable stratification. And there was a question about logging and water temperature. So there were a couple studies from Ontario that found reduced shoreline vegetation due to fire resulted in higher water temperatures. So that may be something that could speak to that question. And also they, they uh, identified that with these increased water temperatures, we found a study that modeled declines in lake trout habitat as a, as a result. In terms of chemical effects of fire in lakes, generally studies found increases in TP and TN but not in eutrophic lakes or after rapid vegetation regrowth that then took up those nutrients. Generally, they found increases in DOC, but results for cations and pH were inconsistent. Some increases, some decreases, sometimes no effect. And they attribute this variability due to variability in geology, soils, and fire characteristics. And in terms of biological effects of fire in lakes, Generally, studies found increases in chlorophyll A. And I know this is probably something that's of interest to many of you folks, but this was not the case when there was light limitation. As I mentioned, some of these lakes experienced increases in DOC and, and uh, decreases in light availability. And also they didn't see increases in chlorophyll A in very eutrophic lakes that had high pre-fire nutrient pools. Generally also, they were finding increases in zooplankton, some macroinvertebrates, no effects on water birds, and then mixed results for mercury contamination um, in fish and macroinvertebrates. So using all of these past studies, we were able to paint a sort of picture of fire effects on lakes and thinking about the, not only just the direct effects on lakes, but also the effects of fire on the landscape. Um, so for example, changes in runoff and uh, evapotranspiration in Burned areas can translate to physical, chemical, and biological effects on the lake itself, as well as potentially downstream aquatic ecosystems as well. So we did learn some things from this review. We did learn that fires can have physical, chemical, and biological effects on lakes. And we did find that lake landscape and fire characteristics can mediate these effects. But we do need to interpret all of these results with caution. First of all, most of these only studied a limited number of weeks, often between one and 10. And many of these studies out of these 14 actually went back and studied the same lakes again. So there weren't that many different lakes in these, in these studies we reviewed. There was not a whole lot of temporal data, often just one to three years of post-fire data. And very rarely was there pre-fire data. So they were often working between basically burned and unburned reference conditions for comparison. And then finally, and perhaps most significantly, the studies we reviewed were mostly from boreal ecosystems, mostly in Canada, Alaska, and really not that many even in the United States. So a lot of these systems look kind of like what you're seeing here. And these really don't look a whole lot like the ones that we see in California, particularly where we see a lot of large reservoirs. This is where I think we need more broad scale studies as Angela mentioned. With these, we'll be able to look across the broader diversity of lake types, landscape types and fire regimes. So we can tease out some of these mediating effects of these different characteristics on lake responses to fires. So the first thing we did was look at where we could get a lot of lake data at once. So one of the things that my lab has been doing is developing water quality databases for the whole US. So a few years ago, we came out with this database called Lagos Northeast, in which we assembled water quality data sets from basically anyone who collects them. So that was 87 different agencies, universities, nonprofits, and citizen science groups. So this was just for, this, the, for uh, 17 Northeastern and Midwestern states, which was about 51,000 lakes, 10,000 of which had water quality data. So the hope there was that some of these lakes that had been sampled had also experienced recent fire. So there weren't all that many that we found in this database. We did find a dozen or so in the upper Midwest. And these lakes here, so y-axis is post-fire secchi depth, and then x-axis is the proportion of the water that was burned. 
So basically that what this negative relationship shows is that watersheds had more fire seem to have reduced water clarity the year after the fire. So we don't know why that is. It could be due to sediments. It could be due to DOC. But it does seem to be, um, there does seem to be something going on in these Midwestern watersheds at least. So I mentioned earlier also that we are working on all the lakes in the continental US. We have all their watersheds. We have all their watershed fire histories. So the next step was in our next iteration of this Lagos database, which we're calling Lagos US, to try to find other lakes that had experienced recent um, watershed fires and that have water quality data. So we did the same thing, going after agencies, citizen science programs, anywhere where we could get water quality data for lakes. Unfortunately, in this instance though, we didn't find a lot. So excluding the lakes in Minnesota and Wisconsin we looked at before, we only found 11 lakes in this entire um, rest of the country where there, someone had sampled water quality the year after fire. So we only looked at Secchi depth here, but that's the most commonly sampled water quality variable. So that's a good indicator of overall data availability. So yeah, we just found a few lakes in Florida and a few in the West. So this really isn't a whole lot to go on when we're trying to look across a wide range of different lake types, landscape types in the fire regimes to try to get at these mediating, mediating factors. So the next thing we turn to is remote sensing. So studies have shown that things like turbidity, chlorophyll A, and secchi depth can be estimated relatively well using satellite imagery, particularly Landsat data. And what's great about these is that there's sub-annual temporal resolution. So there was a question about this earlier, and I think this is where we can get around some of the limitations of traditional field sampling where we maybe don't sample as often as we would like to. And another advantage of, of using remote sensing is that we can get at very wide gradients of percent watershed burn, burn severity, as well as lake size. So this helps us get at this wide diversity of lakes, landscapes, and fire regimes that I think we need to kind of disentangle what factors influence fire effects on lakes. So in essence, we can look across all these different, different types of systems that would be a lot harder to do if we're just relying on traditional field sampling. So as a pilot, what we decided to do was look at three regions across the US to try to see how well we can look at fire effects on lakes using remotely sensed water quality data. The first region is Northeast Minnesota, where I showed you some field data. And the thinking here is that this is a landscape that has a lot of lakes, but not a ton of fire. The red polygons represent fire here. Next, we looked at a region in, in Northern California, which includes Clear Lake. And here we have lots of fire, but not as many lakes. And also we have a lot of large reservoirs out here. And then in Florida, it's our third region. Down there, we have a lot of lakes and a lot of fire. So just a lot going on down there. We thought these would be three interesting points of comparison. So we haven't actually run all the remote thing yet, but i can show you what this might look like. In this Northeastern Minnesota region, there were 241 lakes greater than eight hectares that had some amount of wildfire between 84 and 2016. An eight hectare cutoff is usually used as uh, a threshold for being able to detect water quality um, remotely, just given the resolution of satellite imagery. So what this means is that um, there's potentially a lot of, of, of case studies just within this small Minnesota landscape. So here's a zoomed in picture of that region. The blue polygons are lakes. Again, the red is the wildfire. So by looking at the fire history for this, this Landsat footprint, this satellite image area, we could see that there was one fire year that stood out, this 2011 fire year. So we decided to hone in on that. So in that year, there were 69 lakes that had some amount of wildfire in its watershed. But what this means is that there were dozens more unburned or reference lakes. Again, this is Minnesota where there's a lot of lakes. And this also produces a very wide grade percent watershed burned. So if we look at that, we can see across these 69 lakes or so, we have some lakes that experienced 
less than 10% of its watershed, some that's about half, and also many that experienced between 90 and 100% of its watershed burn. So there's all these different potential case studies just within this single fire year, single land landscape in Minnesota. And also we, are, we have the ability to look at the effects of high severity fire in this landscape. So there were 67 lakes that had some amount of high severity fire in their watersheds. And that's defined as greater than 70% canopy loss. And again, we can look at the gradient here. So some watersheds that had just a little bit of high severity fire and some that had quite a lot. So again, there's just a wide diversity of individual case studies that we can look at to try to figure out why lakes respond to fire in certain ways. So to wrap up here, um, this work is ongoing. You know, I continue to uh, look forward to what we can get out of this, but the way I think about how we can move forward with studying lakes, lakes and fires, I think of these, what I'm calling the three Cs. So the first is complementary. So I wanna emphasize that I don't think these broad scale studies are the end all, and I don't think they're gonna solve our, 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 all of our questions when it comes to studying lake effects or uh, fire effects on lakes. We really need local scale and broad scale studies to go hand in hand. Not only do the local scale studies provide us with the data, but they also allow us to come up with hypotheses, test out mechanisms, and do things that are hard to do when you're just looking at dots on a graph, for example. I also think that collaboration is really key. So I think, and, and Angela mentioned this as well, but I think it's worth re-emphasizing that Getting an idea as a researcher what types of questions managers have and what sorts of things they would like us to look at and how we can learn from them, I think that's also been really important. That's something that can't be overstated. And then finally, I think creativity is going to be important as well. So as I mentioned, the data are lacking. Even when we looked, even when we scoured databases across the US, we still couldn't find that many lakes that had been sampled in burned watersheds. So we are gonna to need to look across diverse sources. This could, this could include remote sensing, using long-term data sets like Clear Lake and others in the region. I think only by doing all these things can we get a more complete picture of how lakes and other aquatic ecosystems respond to fires uh, moving forward. All right, so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge we're funded by the NSF Macro Systems Program. Um, Co-authors who've helped me along various stages of this. If you're interested in our database, there's our website there. And yeah, thank you all for being here and listening. And if there's time questions, I'm happy to take those. Hi, yes, there's a, there's a few minutes for questions and thank you, Ian, for that fantastic presentation. And if there's anybody who has any questions, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, Ian, this is Sue Keitel with EPA. I'm, I'm surprised that you didn't come across Lake Tahoe as a water body with lots of secchi depth sampling and it's also experienced um, fires and wondering if maybe it was um, eliminated or wondering if you're aware of it. Yeah, we are certainly aware of Lake Tahoe. I mean, we did come across one paper that had looked at um, some of the uh, fire history and some of the smoke impacts and things like that. Um, but in terms of looking, in terms of actually looking at watershed fire impacts and on and water quality, we actually didn't find much on Lake Tahoe. So just to understand, you're looking for, uh, you're doing a review of published articles as opposed to looking at raw data that might be available in WQX oh, okay. or the state information. Okay, so I may have um, misinterpreted your question. So yes, so in the, at first we were just looking for past studies that looked at fire effects on lakes and found one study that, that talked about, um, I think it might've been in the context of the Rim Fire, um, but, we didn't actually do um, the follow-up study would be looking at actual water quality data and um, fire impacts. And so maybe you're asking about that map where I showed 
lakes that had been sampled years after fire. So I, I can double check why Lake Tahoe didn't come up with come up in that one. It may just be that that version of our database didn't have Lake Tahoe in it yet. But um, with that, though, Lake Tahoe is such a unique system. It almost deserves to be studied on its own. I would not want to lump it in with a lot of small lakes in other parts of the country. Thank you, Sue, for that. Yeah, I would say the same with Clear Lake. There's certainly a lot of data collected on Clear Lake, both HABs and uh, water chemistry and sucky disks. So, and we've had a lot of fires. Um, there was a question in the uh, chat. Sorry if I missed it, but what satellite imagery products were you planning to use for your analysis? Yeah, so I probably just went over this pretty quickly. So we are starting with the Landsat series since they're publicly available. They go back to 84 and the uh, temporal and spatial resolution are a pretty good balance of what we're looking for. We can get down to fairly small lakes. So I mentioned eight hectares is a safe cutoff, but you can even get down to even smaller ones if the lake is relatively round and there's not a lot of shoreline that can mess up the pixels. And also the sub-annual temporal resolution is nice. The, uh, 16 day return interval for Landsat sounds great, but that's assuming you, you know, have cloud free images and not a lot of atmospheric um, interference. So just having the ability to get multiple samples per year is, is really key with that as well. So um, maybe we'll look at other ones in the future, but we're gonna start with Landsat. Thank you for that. Um, any other questions for Ian? Ian, I'm hoping you can come back with more analysis uh, as you move through your projects. This is fantastic information. Yeah, this is Dave Karen. I would just like to add that that was really amazing doing almost half a million uh, lakes in order to get a dozen uh, studies. And I think that's, I think you've made a really good point. Your your three C's at the end are right on the, the money. Um, it's gonna be very difficult because you can never plan these things, obviously, uh, but you have to be reactive, which is always difficult, both from a, a research point of view and, and from a financial point of view, just getting the funding in place. So uh, that was a really great talk. Yeah, thanks, David. I appreciate that and that's I think part of the value of the remote sensing is that you know I mentioned in our review we had found very few studies that had pre-fire data and post-fire data most cases they were just looking at post-fire data and trying to compare it to some other unburned watershed that may have differences in lake morphometry or geology or who knows that could influence the differences across those systems so by using the remote sensing record we can actually go back and look at all of these different events and then try to figure out, okay, well, maybe this lake responded this way because it had 40% of its watershed burn, whereas this one had 60% of its watershed burn, but this one was a small lake and this one was a eutrophic lake. And when you, when you just work on one system, it's really hard to tease that all apart. But on my end of the spectrum, if we're just sitting at a, at a computer in, in Michigan, you know, we don't really understand kind of what some of these mediating mechanisms can be. And that's why it's really nice to work with folks like Angela who are out collecting the data and know what's going on. So that's our work and plan moving forward. And hopefully, you know, we can share some more in the future. But thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ian, so much. All right, we're going to move to the uh, next item on the agenda. I will go ahead and share my screen just to bring that up. Um, subcommittee reports. And I think we're going to be starting with Becky on that. Sure, thanks. Um, so I wanted to uh, let everybody know, so I'm representing the Have Related Illness Work Group, which is um, um, State Water Resources Control Board, um, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, and uh, California Department of Public Health are tracking California. Um, and so we've been working since um, uh, reporting out from since 2018 and um, started doing marine habs um, with 2019 data. And so for 2020 data of what we were considering have related and submitted into the CDC's One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System or OHEBS. Um, and we're um, looking at changing this year to individuals. Previously, we were reporting as cases. So if 
um, we got a report of an illness that might have included multiple dogs or multiple humans, we counted as one and uh, we think it's going to be easier as easier for us to track as individuals. Um, unless we're submitting it as a group, um, like for fish. So we had 10 dogs for fish, again, which could be multiple fish, um, and 15 human cases for 2020 from freshwater HABs. Um, and then we'll work on um, uh, switching our previous year's data and getting those um, uh, the illness tracking pages updated. Um, the other thing I wanted to share, if I can, share screen quickly um, is uh, CDC um, also put out um, their uh, summary report of um, cases that were submitted into OHABs um, from 2016 to 2018. Um, so that's available now. Um, I put that link in the chat um, and um, so if there's any questions on that, or if people had seen that, there's also on the OHEP page, there's uh, summary tables um, that have additional, or they're considered like supplementary figures in tables that have some more details on that. Um, and um, for, for most um, the cases, um, it was as um, also as individuals. So that was also part of our incentive to try to update ours so we can match that way. Um, I just want to point out there was one um, 2018 uh, wildlife case um, that was uh, highlighted and uh, we have since withdrawn. There was a final um, CDFW uh, a, a report um, that um, suggested um, that HABs were, were not the cause of the event. So we have uh, withdrawn that one, but it was in the initial report and uh, based on preliminary information. So. Um, Happy to follow up more on that offline. Um, feel free to contact me, but um, just wanted to um, share some of that information. And again, we will be um, updating all our illness tracking information as we get these all pulled together and get those updated and approved. So um, I'll bring back that information back at the next meeting. Thanks. Um, Becky, quick question for you on that. Uh, would you be able to, and, and maybe this, well, the next meeting is, is uh, July 21st. Um, can you remind everybody where or, or what the process is if there is a suspected illness of a, a human or animal? Uh, is there a, a, you know, remind them of the portal or how they should reach out? Yeah, um, I, I, our, our preference ideally is um, in the HAB portal bloom report form. There are check boxes toward the bottom that you can report um, a human or animal illness. Um, and that gives us um, uh, that information as well as the location and date and all the details um, in, a, in an online uh, format. And it also provides some automatic notifications to uh, state and regional staff um, when those come in that way. But alternatively, there is the option to use the Sinohabs report uh, email and hotline number. Um, so those all work as well if that's a preference. Um, so that's the our preferred mechanism, but we um, do hear about uh, illness cases through other mechanisms as well, but we'd like to funnel people over through there. Um, we also are reporting now for marine habs, so if there is a case for marine habs, um, you can, um, I'll put the, um, OEHA has a marine hab illness reporting webpage, and um, that's that's a little different um, because the the HAB portal is uh, focused on freshwater and estuarine HAB. So I'll put that link in there. Thanks. Thank you, Becky. And it looks like Keith has shared the link to the uh, for, for the illness reporting and that's on the mywaterquality.ca.gov slash HABs slash DO slash bloomreport.html. Thank you, Keith. Oh, and that makes a point. I'll add that um, the OE HAB page now we have um, we have links to both our freshwater and uh, marine illness tracking pages. So um, that's also a place to look for if you're wondering both both aspects. Thank you. Um, all right, we will move. Uh, are, are there any questions for Becky from anyone for the subcommittee, the illness work group subcommittee? All right. We will move to the mitigation subcommittee. And Dave, I believe you were going to be presenting on that. Can you give me that update? 
Yeah, I can weigh in on that. So um, Hugh Dalton and uh, uh, Kerry Austin were not able to, to make it today. Uh, we're in a kind of a transition period with the subcommittee. Uh, Kerry is stepping down as the chair of that and Hugh is stepping up. Uh, but he had something else booked today, so he couldn't make it. Um, we had our last meeting. It's still a very active subcommittee. Uh, the the emphasis is um, still trying to get people in who can talk about mitigation, um, evaluating approaches. Um, we still have a, a preliminary lake survey that we're kind of batting around as an idea, uh, trying to find places where we can apply that to. Our last meeting was on uh, March 16th. And we had uh, two speakers who gave one presentation, uh, Chris Stransky, who is with Wood Environment, and Rebecca Gill, who is with Riverside County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. And they gave a talk on the Holy Fire and its impact on Lake Elsinore. Uh, that was the Holy Fire was in 2018 and impact on Lake Elsinore and surrounding uh, basin. Um, and it was really an amazing talk. Uh, if we go forward with a larger um, uh, presentation or, or some sort of a mini symposium on, on uh, lakes and fires, um, I'm sure this will be a part of it. Uh, the, um, the, the upshot of it was that uh, when the fire occurred, they knew it was gonna be bad news for Elsinore, which is in the lower part of the basin. And they, they did an amazing amount to essentially create an area where sediments coming down with the first and, and subsequent rains could be caught. And I've forgotten the number, but there was some ungodly thousands or hundreds of thousands of cubic yards of sediment that was prevented from going into the lake, which was a tremendous response when you think about what they had to mobilize. Uh, they also did, of course, see some effects within Lake Elsinore, and that's, that's what the talk uh, was about. So uh, rather than uh, doing complete uh, disclosure here, we'll, we'll hopefully see them at a later time. Um, the, the other thing worth noting, our next monthly meeting is going to be in April on April 20th. And I believe Alex Horn has agreed to give a talk. Uh, Alex, if you've heard the name, if you've been in limnology for the last 50 years, you've probably heard the name. Uh, he's um, a very, very uh, accomplished and interesting person. And he's going to be talking on the 20th at 2.30 uh, p.m. Uh, Pacific time. So if you want to tune into that, um, that that's out there. I think that's really about it for the subcommittee right now. Great. Thank you for that. Um, and I guess if anybody is interested on being, uh, being on the mitigation subcommittee, Dave, who should they reach out to? That would be Hugh now. Uh, Hugh is, is just retired. I believe this month um, from the Santa Cruz um, water district or I'm not exactly sure if that's the terminology, but he has retired and he is going to take, has taken over now uh, the chairperson position for the subcommittee. All right, and do you, could you put his email address in the chat? I can do that. Okay, so anybody who is interested in um, getting the invite for the next mitigation subcommittee or um, learning more about it, uh, please contact the new. And I, I do have, sorry, I meant to add, I do have the actual slides uh, from the Chris and Rebecca's talk, uh, but you know, it's a large file. I can't figure out a way to, to upload it or attach it to Zoom. Um, I'm trying to get a link. Hugh is trying to find if there is a link to that recorded talk. Uh, which if I get it before the end of this meeting, I will also put that up in the chat. But otherwise, if people want that, they, they can contact me. Thank you, Dave. Uh, in terms of subcommittee reports, we are not gonna have a, a update on the statewide guidance subcommittee unless uh, uh, Becky has anything. I know that Marissa Van Dyke was planning on being here, but uh, was unable to be at the meeting. Um, or I'm sorry, unable to be at today's meeting. So I believe we'll be just passing unless you've got something, Becky? No, that's fine. Okay. So um, next item on the agenda is, uh, I've already shared the uh, dates for 2021. Um, we've discussed some of the topics. 
a uh, lot of interest in the uh, mini summit or symposium uh, for wildfires and HABs. Um, are there any other thoughts, uh, any other ideas that people would like to see or, or presentations or people they'd like us to invite? I know we'll be um, presenting on our CalWatch, uh, on Clear Lake, our CalWatch project that we're doing with, with uh, Tracking California and other entities um, for HABs and uh, private drinking water systems. That'll be coming up, um, probably put on the fall agenda. All right. Um, so in terms of uh, in terms of wrap up, I know that um, this because this meeting was recorded, it is going to be located on um, Dave, maybe you can remind me, uh, let everybody know where information is going to go. I, I, there's going to be minutes that are uh, ADA compliant that'll go on the CC Hab um, web page and the uh, this recording will go on where Dave? Uh, actually, I believe uh, I what I'd try and do is to get it to Nick in a format he can download, and I believe he puts it up on YouTube. Uh, Nick, you can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, that's that's right. Nick, could you share the link to that YouTube page? Uh, in yeah, the yeah, I'm trying to get it right now. Sorry, it was oh, playing. Um, there's a whole playlist for just. Uh, there we go. So the presentations, because they're most likely not ADA compliant, uh, we, we will be linking to them, but can't, won't actually be putting them on the CC Hub page. So uh, if people do want the um, specific presentations and we can get them to be shared by the, by the presenters, then uh, please send an email over to myself or Becky or Dave, and we will uh, send the presentations out. And thank you, Nick, for posting the CC Hub playlist. Uh, thank you, Keith. I'm seeing your your topic, uh, your comment on proposals that were HAB related. All right, I think that is it for our uh, spring meeting. Any other comments or thoughts? I have a quick question. If anybody in the group knows if um, there are drinking water reservoirs or lakes down south that also have quagga mussels, and if if they're is an opportunity to learn from their um, efforts for if, if they're have uh, sources as well, or if they see blooms. I'm trying to figure out the interaction with uh, mussels and lakes in California, invasive mussels and habs that are also drinking water reservoirs. Um, and so I don't know if, if all those three things exist um, for any of the, the systems down south that have invasive mussels. We haven't had, um, a new water body with invasive mussels since 2017, but for lakes that do have drinking water treatment systems, the impact of a mussel introduction would be like catastrophic, particularly if they're focused on HAB treatments, you know, or so I'm trying to figure out is there, is this an avenue, is this a, a forum for that, learning anything about that as we plan, um, you know, for, for managers that are dealing with HABs and then also potential introduction of mussels, which they're possible for any of our water bodies. So I didn't know if that was, if this is the best place for something to think about or if there's anything um, available from any of those systems down south that, that have mussels that also have HABs and drinking water. I think you might check with uh, CDFW's Aquatic Invasive Species Program might at least have, you know, which ones have quagga, but the overlap of the other things might just get you a list and, and have to go from there as far as drinking water source and HABs. I don't know if they would know that as well. Yeah, I have the list of those lakes. I didn't know if there was lake managers or, or regions in here in this group that had mussels and were um, dealing with HABs and then knew if they had drinking water. So I was just trying to start that process of who to reach out to or see if that was valuable to the group at all. Great question. Angela, uh, definitely an important topic. Um, Barbara has reached out to say, check with Metropolitan Water District. Where is that in uh, the LA region or? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much for uh, being a part of today's meeting. Uh, your questions have been great. The uh, uh, updates have been really good. And also the presenters have done a fantastic job. So we're going to uh, end early and uh, get ourselves prepared for the July meeting, July 21st. Uh, we'll see you virtually again and look for an agenda and also the minutes on our page. Please take a look. And you can also sign up for the listserv. There is a CC Hub um, mailing list where you can get information. Uh, thank you all so much. And unless the uh, co-chairs co have any other comments, you guys want to? I'm good. Thanks for joining. Great job, Sarah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, great everybody. job. Thank you. Thank all you. right. See you next time. Thank you.